Good afternoon. Very good. I'm Councilmember Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and today we are here to discuss how opioid prosecutions are handled in New York City by our district attorneys, the special narcotics prosecutor, and our courts. The opioid crisis is ravaging communities across the city. Neighborhoods like Mott Haven in the Bronx and South Beach in Staten Island have been hit the hardest, but the damage can be seen across the city. There were 1,441 overdose deaths in the city last year, compared to just 292 homicides. If there were 1,441 homicides in the city of New York, that would be all we would be talking about. More and more, we see the opioid e epidemic as a public health crisis, but it has also forced us to reevaluate how our criminal justice system treats drug crimes, especially those driven by addiction. We need thoughtful and determined prosecutors who will correctly draw the line between opioid users and addicts on the one side and predatory dealers and drug organizations on the other. The city's five district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor have sought to cut off the supply of illicit narcotics in the city while offering diversion programming to some individuals charged with possession. Our inquiry is into how these offices deal with these sometimes competing concerns and whether their strategies for protecting New York from the opioid trade are effective. And, of course, how can the council and the administration support these efforts? Recent reporting, in the New York Times in particular, about a growing trend among prosecutors around the country of charging so-called co-users, often friends and family, with homicide is alarming. Likewise are reports of undercover operations outside methadone clinics, stigmatizing treatment while do doing nothing to address supply. Distinguishing between addicts tragically looking for their next fix and criminally culpable dealers in the business of dealing is no doubt a tremendous challenge, but justice demands that we do so. This council and this city, including its criminal justice system, has embraced the importance of diverting people into treatment and out of the cycle of arrest and incarceration. <clears throat> Many of our city's prosecutors have supported and invested in a number of new creative diversion programs devoted to treatment over punishment. The Heroin Overdose Prevention and Education Program, or HOPE, in Staten Island and Manhattan, the Collaborative Legal Engagement Assistance Response, or CLEAR, program in Brooklyn, the Overdose, Overdose Avoidance and Recovery, or OR, program in the Bronx, <clears throat> and the Queens Treatment and Intervention Program, or QTIP, in Queens, are intended to complement existing drug treatment programs that predate the current opioid crisis. What do they do? Is their, is their eligibility as broad as possible, consistent with public safety? And do they have the capacity to meet the growing need? We look forward to hearing from our judiciary, from all five of our district attorney offices, the special narcotics prosecutor, our public defenders, and advocates on these critically important issues facing our city. With that, um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, um, the Honorable George A. Grasso, supervising judge of Bronx Criminal Court, as our fir wit first witness. Um, judge, judge Grasso, we're very uh, grateful that you came and uh, that you've come to give testimony, and we're very interested in the work that you're doing up in the Bronx. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Lansman and members of the Committee on the Criminal Justice System. It is truly my pleasure to have this opportunity to address the City Council on this crucial matter. With me are Maria Almonte Weston, Project Director of Bronx Community Solutions, and on my right, my court attorney, Ms. Charlene Daniels. Without a doubt, our city is facing a crisis. According to data provided by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, there were 1,441 unintentional overdose deaths in New York City in 2017. Of that number, 342 were recorded in the Bronx. For a matter of scale, I would compare that to the 292 homicide deaths recorded in New York City by the NYPD in 2017. I find it sadly ironic that as our city 
is experiencing record low numbers in homicide deaths, that unintentional overdose deaths are spiking year after year. For example, in the Bronx, the number of unintentional overdose deaths have more than doubled from 162 in 2013. Behind those numbers lie the scourge of opioid abuse. New York City data tells us that opioids are involved in more than 80% of all overdose deaths and that fentanyl, a highly potent synthetic opioid, is involved in approximately half of these deaths. According to the Center for Disease Control, CDC, fentanyl is much more potent than heroin and up to 100 times more potent than morphine. The danger of fentanyl lies not only in its potency, but also in its appearance. Users are generally unable to recognize when the drug they have purchased is laced with fentanyl. The really terrible news is that fentanyl is now being mixed with everything from heroin to pills to cocaine and wreaking havoc and death throughout New York City. The question for us today is how best to address this crisis in the criminal court of the city of New York. The first thing we need to be cognizant of is that early engagement of an individual at high risk of overdose is crucial. Every day, this individual is buying drugs on our streets. That individual is engaging in a version of Russian roulette. The criminal court is the key component of the criminal justice system for early engagement after an individual is arrested and charged with a crime. In this respect, our arraignment parts need to be fully engaged. It is the recognition of this fundamental principle that has led to the creation of the Overdose Avoidance and Recovery Track, or working in partnership with the Bronx District Attorney, Bronx Community Solutions, BCS, and the Bronx Defense Bar, the criminal court launched the OR Track in, De in December of 2017. OR is a highly specialized court track to address the high risk of drug overdose and death resulting from the scourge of opioids, including the deadly fentanyl. In February of 2018, in her State of the Judiciary Address, Chief Judge Janet De Fiore charged me with spearheading the expansion of the OR track citywide. With the full support of our Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks and the Administrative Judge of the Criminal Court, Tamiko Amaker, specific plans to expand the OR track are currently underway. It is my belief that the OR track will soon be in place in Manhattan and Brooklyn. OR track cases are identified at arraignments. Assistant District Attorneys, ADAs, identify and flag all misdemeanor complaints that contain a charge of criminal possession of a controlled substance in the seventh degree, Penal Law Section 22003. And if no temporary order of protection is attached to the case, it is presumptively eligible for or, but the district attorney still retains discretion. The ADA then refers the case to BCS staff who notify the defense counsel of the OR designation. The defense counsel then reviews the case with their client and advises if their client wishes to be interviewed. If the client declines, then the case proceeds to arraignment. In those cases where a defendant agrees to be interviewed, BCS will conduct an assessment to ascertain if the defendant is at a high risk of overdose. If so, the defendant is deemed eligible for the OR track. If not, the case proceeds as any other case would. Cash bail is never requested in cases where an eligible defendant chooses to proceed on the OR track. OR track defendants are released on their own recognizance or placed on supervised release. Defendants participating in the OR track 
agreed to av avoid rearrest and meaningfully engage in a BCS designated program. They also agree to participate in a post arraignment follow up assessment, usually the next business day, with BCS so an appropriate treatment plan can be developed. If the defendant decides to opt out of the OR track at any time, the defendant will not be penalized in any way. Post arraignment, OR track cases are adjourned to a specialized court part, AP7, which I preside over, or AP9, which is presided over by Judge Linda Paus Lopez. While cases are in the OR track, the district attorney suspends criminal prosecution and the defense counsel tolls motion practice and waives speedy trial provisions in CPL 3030. Defendants are advised by the court on their first appearance that OR track cases are not typical crime and punishment matters. They are advised that if they uphold their end of the agreement that they made at arraignment, that the district attorney, the defense attorney, and the judge are aligned with the same interest, which is to see that the pending criminal case is dismissed and sealed. It is explained to them that the dismissal will occur once the BCS representative makes a record that the defendant has meaningfully engaged in treatment, is on a path to recovery, and is no longer at a present risk of overdose. Since we have begun the OR track in December, I have found that in general, those defendants who have made an initial appearance have been positively engaged with the goals of the program. The intensity and frequency of the court's interaction with various defendants is dependent upon feedback from BCS as to the quality of the defendant's engagement with the assessed treatment program. Obviously, some individuals require a bit more TLC than others. What I have shared with you is a brief overview of the criminal court's efforts to play a positive role in engaging with our partners in the criminal justice system to utilize our resources in a meaningful and compassionate way to save lives of individuals who are at serious risk of overdose and death. I cannot say enough about the commitment of our fellow stakeholders. The Bronx District Attorney, Darcel Clark, and her team of dedicated assistants led by ADA Aisha Green have gone all in in assisting the court to make OR a reality. We are continuing to work together to expand the reach and scope of OR in the Bronx. Maria Almonte Weston and her team in BCS led by Carmen Alcantara, have literally worked around the clock seven days a week to provide hope to individuals who had all but given up on themselves. The Bronx Defenders and the Legal Aid Society have worked with us as partners every step of the way from conception to implementation. Their input and cooperation has been crucial to the court's ability to establish credibility with individuals in need and steer them to a path to recovery. All in all, our experience in creating and implementing the OR track in the Bronx is a working model of the potential of the criminal court to engage stakeholders and innovate in real time. Our ultimate goal is to do what we can in the criminal court to reduce the totally unacceptable rates of overdose and death in our city. Before I close, I would like to leave you with the feedback from one of our defendants as I requested him to approach the bench and receive a certificate acknowledging his successful completion of the OR track this past April. The court, 
Yes, I'm going to ask you what, if anything, you've gotten out of this. The defendant. Well, back when I was arrested, I don't look at it as I got arrested. I got rescued, actually. And it was coming to your court and taking advantage of your court and the things that you implement I never seen before. So I thank you for your clemency. I thank you for, they talk about they're going to give me a certificate. They need to give you a certificate. I sit here and I listen to you talk to the people. You are sincere. I hear you talk, Judge Grasso, and I'd just like to thank you. Like I said, I didn't get arrested. I got rescued. And I've got to take it a day at a time. I go to Narcotics Anonymous. I have a sponsor who has a sponsor. I will just take it a day at a time, Your Honor. And I would like to just thank you from the bottom of my heart. The court, let me tell you something. You just gave me my certificate. I want to congratulate you, and I'm going to ask you to come up here so I can give you, come up here, sir. The defendant, can I shake your hand? The court, thank you, sir. What I have just shared with you is taken from the official court transcript of the OR track proceeding on April 11, 2018. The defendant was an African-American man of about 50 years of age who had a substantial previous history with the criminal justice system. I was very moved by his feedback and I think it really sums up what we are trying to accomplish. I thank you all for your attention, and Ms. Almonte Weston would like to take a few moments. She has some pertinent information to share with you as well, and then we will be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lanceman and um, uh, committee members. I wanted to just be able to share three stories to just bring this to light. Um, CT is a 52-year-old African-American male who disclosed usage began when he discovered heroin was cheaper than his Percocet co-pays under Medicare. CT was formerly part of a laborers' union and living off his retiree pension. During assessment, CT divulged having lost three friends to fatal overdose. He was referred to a medication-assisted treatment facility that would offer groups and methadone maintenance on a sliding scale fee. At his first court appearance, laboratory analysis concluded that fentanyl was found in the substance he purchased. It contained 2.71% of fentanyl. CT was surprised by the report and stated this arrest possibly saved his life. During the course of treatment, CT experienced another loss due to the opioid epidemic. The impact of this news led to a brief psychiatric hospitalization. But upon discharge, this further motivated CT to continue in treatment as he did not want to be another statistic. He continued in treatment and sought mental health services. Due to his continued efforts in outpatient services and medication-assisted treatment, the district attorney's office requested CT to be requested a dismissal and seal. As Judge Grasso granted dismissal of case and presented CT with his certificate of completion, CT stated he wished he could award the judge a certificate for saving his life and offering moral support through the process. Young EM is a 22-year-old Hispanic male who reports his primary substance of choice to be street Xanax. Six months prior to his arrest, EM was in a dirt bike accident that led to a titanium rod and screws being implanted in his left leg. EM, who reported never engaging in usage other than marijuana, was disabled and prescribed Percocet, which left him feeling like a zombie. A friend offered him Xanax, at which time began, he began his illicit usage. After his arrest, he was referred to BCS for assessment. EM was resistant and stated he did not want to be labeled as a quote unquote drug addict. When referred to a provider A, 
EM stated that counselors did not make any effort to engage him, and he felt as if he could not identify with any of the clients there. After multiple attempts to conference with provider A, BCS made the decision to refer EM to another provider. Upon intake with provider B, EM stated that he felt as if someone was actually listening to him. He went from refusing to engage to sharing with peers. EM refrained from usage of his primary substance of choice and also began to address his cannabis use. He was connected to a primary physician and referred to pain management. After almost 45 days with provider B, EM was moved to a vocational track and secured employment. At his last court appearance, EM stated that he had never felt as if anyone ever cared before until he was referred to BCS and the OR program. He stated this, that his recovery would be a long road, but he was confident he now had all the support he needed. And finally, I wanted to introduce you to Mr. D, who is a 50-year-old Hispanic male who reported a social usage of cocaine. Mr. D had never been in treatment and was unable to recognize his need for intervention services. Upon entering outpatient services, Mr. D was very resistant, avoided toxicology testing, and denied all usage. After four months of unsuccessful outpatient services, the judge gave Mr. D one last opportunity and, re and requested that he consider inpatient rehab. This time was different, and his wife and daughter were in the audience. Mr. D recognized that he had to change for his future and his family. It was at that moment that Mr. D was motivated for change. He became an active participant during group sessions not only learning from his peers, but sharing his experiences with them. He went from aggressive to active engagement. At his last court appearance, Judge Grasso signed two certificates, one in English and one in Spanish, Mr. D's sole language. The judge presented one to Mr. D and the other to his wife, because without her support, his success would not have been possible. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate hearing that, uh, that personal experience. Um, at the end of the day, that's what we're here for, for the people who are in the criminal justice system. Um, and we want to make sure our criminal justice system is as, as fair and, and finally calibrated as, as possible. Let me mention that we've been joined by Council Member Eric Ulrich uh, from Queens. Um, Judge, I, I just want to ask you a, a few questions, if I, if I can. Um, I'll start with the, the big picture before we get into the, the details of the, of the OR program. Um, I just want to understand the, uh, the mandate or, the, or the, the goal to expand OR citywide, because mm -hmm. we have the other district attorneys here and yes. a special narcotics prosecutor, and they have their respective programs, HOPE, mm -hmm. CLEAR, right. Q-TIP. I feel like there's someone at every office mm -hmm. whose responsibility is just to come up with clever mm -hmm. acronyms. Right. Um, Big picture, can you tell me how the mandate to expand or to all five boroughs, will, will it supplant those programs or, 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 or complement them in some way? It will it'll work, with the, we'll work with the programs. So, and in fact, I'm pleased to say, as I alluded to in my uh, testimony, we have very specific efforts under the, underway right now. Um, you're gonna hear testimony um, in Manhattan and I'll let Manhattan testify for itself, but we are very focused in, in moving in, in, in Manhattan into the Midtown Community Court. We're somewhat along in, in conversations uh, in Brooklyn, and then I am was just on the phone this morning with the administrative judge in uh, Richmond Supreme Court, Judge Desmond Green, about um, plans to, continue to move to the um, court in Staten Island, and then we're certainly gonna be following up in Queens. So we are, we are serious and we're focused on that. So for example, with respect, to, with respect to the HOPE concept. So the HOPE concept is based on something called Project Reset, uh, which is uh, a conceptual idea that you could potentially divert people before they actually got into the uh, criminal courthouse. And I think that's a great idea. 
And uh, I think that uh, it's got a lot of room to grow, not only on Staten Island, I think in the Bronx, I, I mean, throughout the city. But, and in the world we'd like to live in, the world we'd like to live in, you could take something like that and you could wave that magic wand and you could save people and you could have deaths plummeting. But that's not the world we live in. Everybody who comes through that system and interacts with that system isn't ultimately going to be, you know, at the point where we're not going to see them anymore in the criminal justice system. That's not the reality. Also, different programs have different rules of engagement. So the OR concept is how to engage the criminal court as a central player in the criminal justice system. And I've, I've been involved in the, in the police department for 30 years before I became a judge. I'm in my ninth year as a judge. So, you know, I know a few things about different elements of the criminal justice system. And I, I feel that traditionally um, the criminal court has not been involved as much as it, it should and could be in proactive and positive solutions to, to problems, more or less just kind of like a, a clearinghouse. And arraignments are a, a critical and crucial function of the criminal court because that's where the early engagement begins. So what we're doing here and what we have done already is created a, a working model. As of yesterday, when I presided over the OR track, we had two more graduations. That brought us up to 29, 29 since December 4th. And we're, we're, just, we're just getting started with this concept. So I see it as the criminal court is in the middle of the system, the DAs are in the criminal court, the defense bar is in the criminal court, we have service providers in the criminal court. Arraignments have not, typically and traditionally been thought of as problem co solving courts. We're in the process of changing that because we need the early engagement. Well, I think that's very, um, very wise. A lot of the work of this committee um, ends up focusing on what happens at arraignment when all the bail work that we do and, and um, you know, we've got uh, projects that the, the council is funding to, to make that process fair. And, you know, we, we fund a lot of these um, diversion programs. In the budget that we just passed, we increased funding for Hope in Staten Island, for, for Clear in Brooklyn, for Orr in the, the, the Bronx, and I think we did for, for, for Queens as, as, as well. Um, so let me ask you about the role of the arraignment uh, part in, in sorting and, and sifting uh, amongst the thousands of defendants that it's, are seen there every year. And, and, and get to the issue of um, eligibility. Mm -hmm. So I understand for the OR program, eligibility is limited to um, possession of a controlled substance in the seventh degree? 2003. 2003. Um, first question, why did you limit, or why is eligibility so, so limited? Um, there are other charges that people are, 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 are brought um, that relate to, to opioids and, and their addiction. Um, just within the, the, the realm of people charged with a drug offense, why not expand it? Okay, great question. So the short answer, the short answer to the first part of your question, you know, why the 22003? Here's the short answer. We had to start somewhere, mm -hmm. you know? We had, to, we had to start somewhere. So, so, so criminal possession of a controlled substance in the seventh degree, the picking up the heroin, uh, the pills, the crack cocaine, et cetera, et cetera. So it seemed a logical starting point. Furthermore, it's important to understand, and I alluded to this in my testimony, that we're not talking about complaints that are exclusively 22003 complaints. So you're gonna have the 22003 with trespass, theft of service, et cetera. The one excluder is the, a case that involves a, a complainant and an order of protection because we don't want to be in the business of terminating orders of protection as much as we're enthusiastic about or. So that was a starting point. I know you're going to hear from the Bronx District Attorney's Office. They'll be able to give you more data, et cetera. But that was the starting point. We had stakeholders, very collaborative process, which was crucial, crucial. This isn't something like, you know, we just came up with in the criminal court. We had many meetings with Bronx defenders, with the Legal Aid Society, with the district attorney's office, with the service providers, and get to a place 
where we thought we could get something real, get it going, and do it in a way we're going to have the broad buy buy-in that is critical, because that's one of the difficult problems of innovating in the criminal justice system. We have so many pieces to the puzzle. And if you don't think it through properly in the beginning, where you get the pieces fitting properly and get all the key components thinking that they've been heard and that they've had an opportunity to have a voice, you can have something that's great on paper, but it's going to go nowhere. So that's how we started. As we speak, and the good news is, with, as we are continuing, we're having regular stakeholders in the Bronx. We meet roughly every four to six weeks, and we go over our data. We talk about where we want to go. Here's where the energy in the Bronx is now. All of the energy in the Bronx is to expansion. So we're on the same page. We're certainly looking at uh, expanding complaints to 155, 25 uh, cases, the, the pettit larceny cases, the trust. And here's what else we're looking that was, at. That was my next question. Yeah. Outside there the realm go. of drug, drug offenses. Here's what, we're also looking at felonies. We're also looking at, you might say, well, how can we do felonies in criminal court? Well, the way we could do them is we wouldn't be able to handle a felony matter uh, the same way <coughs> we handle a misdemeanor. So, for example, you couldn't take a live felony out of arraignments and designate it into the OR track and just send it to me. But what you could do is you could send it to one of our felony parts in criminal court, and we have a specific part that's been recently, that we've recently created called the FC part. You could give the district attorney an opportunity to carefully review the case and see what kind of buy and bust type felony sale case they're dealing with. Certainly, if you're dealing with someone who's intentionally f selling fentanyl, no. If you're dealing with somebody who they've got a basis to think is, is an operator and a, a member of a drug gang, no. But if you think maybe what you have is an addict selling to an addict and what you're really looking at is a glory, glorified 22003, yes, maybe you should. And then what you could do is the DA could see if there was interest in or with their counterpart, we could have BCS in our felony part. And if everybody thought it was an appropriate case, the district attorney could, and, and, and there was an interview by BCS right in the felony part, indicating the person was at high risk of overdose, we could turn the felony part into the equivalent of an arraignment part, we could dismiss the felony, and we could send the case to the or track. So those are the kinds of ideas that we have in the Bronx, and in fact, we've already done that with one. We think those are good ideas. Thank you. Um, I don't know who uh, among you might be able to answer this question, but um, how, how do you determine if a defendant is a high risk of, of overdose, and what if they're not a high risk of overdose, but they've just been addicted for a long time and they need to get, they need to get treatment, otherwise it's just gonna be back you know, every few weeks. So um, because we are, Bronx Community Solutions is in the arraignment court part, we have court representations. We use a screening tool that was developed by NYU. Um, very quick, five questions that focuses specifically on high risk of overdose. Yes, it's self-reporting, as well as um, user of multiple systems, which has been proven to, to be another indicator of someone who might uh, have been through the emergency room or um, any other kind of criminal justice system or uh, health care. And um, if they are interested and they've talked to their defense attorney and they want to be part of the OR track, then we offer them treatment. If they're not interested, because we are still a provider, we offer them treatment. Individuals um, for um, multiple charges are offered as many services as possible through Bronx Community Solutions, regardless of an alternative to incarceration mandate or not. Just to clarify, when, when you testified that um, if the defendant decides to opt out of the OR track at any time, the defendant will not be penalized in any way, just, the case just resumes from, from where they got into If there were no OR. Right. It's, not, it's, not, it's not a program where the, the ticket to participation is pleading guilty to Pre-plea. Got it. Um, so 
you, 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 you said that there were, I think, 29 people who've completed the program? Yes, as of yesterday. Good. So I've got to ask, how many, out of how many who started and, and how many didn't complete the program? Right. Well, we have some data, and the DA is going to be testifying as well. Um, but I can go to some relevant data. So what I got from um, the district attorney's office in Bronx Community Solutions is from December 4th through May 31st, 2018, that um, 614 um, cases uh, were uh, screened as eligible. Um, of that, um, deemed eligible ultimately based on the use of the NYU tool and the approach that uh, Ms. Almonte discussed, uh, 183 cases were deemed eligible. Um, out of that, uh, we ended up with uh, 138 defendants entering the program, uh, representing uh, 167 cases, and the number completed to date is the 29. So there are different steps along the way. Also, what I have found, and you know, we're gathering data, we're relatively new in the, in the um, program. You know, there are a fair amount of OR defendants, like I said to you, if you're qualified for OR and, you ex and the defendant accepts OR, there's never cash bail. So it's either ROR or supervised release. Now, where supervised complete release comes in, we're dealing with a population of people, some of whom have been around the block a number of times in the criminal justice system, have sig significant flight histories, and, you know, but for supervised release and but for or may very well be ended up going, uh, ending up with some kind of cash bail based upon their flight risk. Frankly, a number of these individuals uh, don't follow through. Uh, some of them don't even end up going, many of them who don't follow through don't even end up going for their first appearance, their first next business day assessment with Bronx Community Solutions. They end up with bench warrants and they end up getting expelled for more and put back on the regular track. I call those individuals, uh, just my own terminology, the unserious or defendant. Someone who just showed up in the rain, you mean I can get out today? Yeah, I'm down with everything, and then boom, they're in the wind and we're picking up, they're getting picked up on a warrant. We'll call that the unserious. And let's say ballpark, maybe as many as 40%. But then there's the serious or defendant. And the way I define serious or defendant is that person does follow up the next business day. They do for, go to BCS. They cooperate their assessment. I see them at their first court appearance. That type of an individual, although we've had, and we are continuing to have some rocky roads, like I said, some people need more TLC than others, they tend to want to remain in place. And oftentimes, they have their defense attorneys, you know, advocating, you know, give them another chance. And, and one of the great things about working with BCS, and what I think is crucial to a success of this kind of program, is we are very flexible. You know, she, we, she mentions a, a couple of scenarios in her vignette where people started off in one way, it wasn't quite working, and we weren't like, say, well, no, it must be this way. That was your original assessment. That, okay, we'll try something else. And we, we've had some very nice success stories doing that. So that um, essentially the data is the data, and that's the best way I can explain what we're looking at and how it's shaking out right now. Thank you. I know Councilman Ulrich, you have questions? I'll be brief, Chair. Thank you very much, and I apologize for being a little late today. Judge, thank you for your testimony and uh, for your service, and I did get a chance to read it in full, so even though I sort of walked in in the middle of it, uh, I have a few questions, um, and, and, and they really come out of my experiences more uh, with the uh, treatment court in Queens with uh, Judge Hirsch, who does a great job. Um, and we're very proud of the Veterans Treatment Court that we were able to push for in all five boroughs. I, I think Judge Moore in the Bronx is uh, the judge for the... Retired. Oh, he's retired. Okay. Uh, You're talking about Supreme Court. Yeah, Supreme right. Court. He right. was doing... This he, is criminal. He had testified here. And, um, right. you know, the research that we've seen is one of the things that made the Veterans Treatment Court so successful was the mentorship component. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that would help with the dropout rate in the criminal court that you experience with the quote-unquote unserious defendants that are coming 
uh, before the court, but if there was any way to get some sort of trained mentors to vo volunteer, these are volunteers. In the Veterans Treatment Court, they're veterans who are you know, sober and clean and on the right track, and they're able to establish a connection and work with, uh, because they're court mandated, the, uh, the defendants there that are facing particular crimes. Uh, but the other problem that I think we see, not only in the, in the Supreme Court, but also I'm sure in the uh, criminal court as well, is that it requires the consent of the local district attorney um, and for participation in these diversion programs. And I always wondered why they didn't just have automatic referrals for nonviolent sort of first time offenders or for certain categories of crimes where we could automatically sort of put these people on that path. Right now you, you need the, the permission of the local district attorney. And uh, I don't know how, how good that is. I, w I would challenge that and I know the, the the prosecutors never want to give up their discretion. We know that. Um, and I think that for the most part, they do a fine job determining which people should and should not participate. But if there was any way to capture more individuals, sort of save them and not let them fall through the cracks, I think we might also see a different outcome in the statistics. So I'm just wondering if there's any way for you to incorporate into what you're doing in the Bronx uh, some sort of mentorship component to try to go after the people that I think really need to be saved the most. And those are some of the folks that you mentioned that, you know, they don't even show up the next day, perhaps. Uh, right, so you, you got a, a lot going on there. So just for starters, just in the context of the or concept and what we're trying to do, when the people who I'm referring to is unserious, it's hard to help them if they don't show up. It's hard to help somebody if they agree they're going to go to an assessment and they blow off the first assessment, they blow off the court appearance, and then maybe you finally bring them in. I've had a few of them that have come in on involuntary returns, and I've still bent over backwards and given them a chance. You know, it, it's new you're enough. On the other, it's, it's you're new, on the other side of the... It's new enough of a program I can actually visualize the people that I'm talking about. Right. And then they just don't do it, so you can't do that. But in terms of your general concept... Of, um, of mentorship playing a role in certain difficult cases. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And that, what that ties into in the model that we've built with Bronx Community Solutions, and I'm hoping and intending that we can build it throughout the city, is the hallmark is flexibility, that we're working with multiple service providers. We're working with multiple approaches. So for example, one of the service providers that we bring in in some of our cases is the Osborne Association. And one of the hallmarks of the Osborne Association is, is building in a mentorship component. And they've had, I, I don't only work with them on or I also run a, um, a youth part in my courtroom and, and they've been absolutely wonderful with some of my more difficult cases involving young people. So we do that as well. Now when you, and when you talk about difficult cases, I, I'm with you, I understand. By definition, if an individual is qualified into or they're a difficult case. They're running that high risk of death and I explain to them straight up when I see them, you know, you, you sh if you're buying street product in the Bronx, you should assume every day is going to be your last day. And that's Russian roulette. And we've had people come in in terrible straits. We did one of the people we graduated yesterday. I mean, he came in, this man was an African-American man, I would say, in his early 60s. He was a complete mess. And he knew he was going to be recommended to, to get his certificate and to get his case. To, he came in in a suit. He, had a, he was so proud. It was like a graduation almost. So we've seen in a relatively short period of time these kinds of transformations in very difficult cases. But they have to engage, and I tell them all the time, they thank us. I always say, yeah, th thank you. We appreciate that you're grateful. But you know what? The DA, the service providers, your lawyer, and the court, it would all amount for nothing if you weren't serious. And it was your seriousness and your commitment. So that's where we go. Sometimes, as you know, Judge, a lot of these people suffer from various mental health issues, and that plays a, a large role in, uh, you know, I think a lot of the bad decisions that they make or the, you know, lack of good judgment. 
And um, again, I think the, getting back to the mentorship, it was, it's so key, that one intervention. In some cases. Uh, and some people who perhaps are sober for many years, who are able to inspire, to connect with, to establish some sort of bond with the defendants, to keep them in the programs, to keep them on the straight now, to check in on them every day with a phone call. If, if it pleases the court. So I just think that that is something that, if there's any way to work that into your model. Certain cases, in certain cases, if we have worked it in, it makes sense. Other cases, it being more of a medically assisted treatment approach. It really is case by case in this case. For sure, no, I'm not yeah. suggesting it's a one size fits all approach, but I, yeah. I do know that it's done wonders mm -hmm. in the uh, Veterans Treatment Court, sure. and they're doing terrific work, and we certainly support and applaud everything that they're doing, but you know we have to share best practices, mm -hmm. and we know what works well and what doesn't work. Clearly, collectively, whatever we're doing now is making somewhat of a dent, but there's overdoses every day throughout the five boroughs. So we, as elected officials and, and members of the judiciary and, and service providers, we have to do more, and we have to keep sort of tackling this and finding a way to do this. I've been to more funerals and wakes than I care to more. mention, and I just think that yeah. We have to do more, and I wish there was something. I wish I had all the answers, and I don't, and I know that you wish the same. But um, maybe, like I said, that mentorship thing is key, I'm telling you. If, if there's any way to work that into your model as a... In some cases we do, depending please, on the Please, please do, because I think, I think it could really be a game changer for helping people get back on path. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, Ms. Amante, Ms. Daniels, thank you so much uh, for being here this morning. It's this afternoon. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from our special narcotics prosecutor and uh, representatives or our district attorneys themselves. Uh, did uh, Queens DA's office send a representative? You're up. Queens DA. This is the DA. These are the DAs. We'll get you a chair. Joshua, can you get her a chair? No, no, over there. <coughs> All right, so the DAs, we do need to, to swear in. So folks, if you'll raise your right hand. You swear a firm testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Terrific. Um, thank you all so much for being here. And um, if we could, we'd love to start with the Special Narcotics Prosecutor. Thank you very much. Uh, my thanks to Council Member Lansman, the chair of the committee here, for giving us the opportunity to discuss how we can justly, fairly, and effectively address the opioid crisis in the city. Uh, as you know, my office 
has citywide jurisdiction over felony narcotics offenses, and we don't have jurisdiction in criminal court. Uh, those kinds of cases are handled by the district attorney's offices. Before I outline my strategy, uh, our strategy uh, to combat the critical challenges we face, I'd like to address some commonly held beliefs about drug enforcement strategy, because I think it's important uh, that we all share the same facts uh, before we can discuss some, some of our um, ideas about how we can best approach our work. Now, my office uh, handles higher level uh, offenses because we have citywide jurisdiction over simply felony offenses. But first and foremost, we need to realize that um, even though nine years after New York State eliminated the Rockefeller drug laws and mandatory pr prison sentences for low-level drug dealers, there's still a lingering perception that large numbers of low-level offenders are sent to prison for drug offenses, sent to state prison. So I urge you to review the chart on page three of my written testimony. It was prepared by the State Division of Criminal Justice Services and the Department of Corrections, which shows that this uh, perception is misguided. In New York City, the number of felony drug arrests and commitments to state prison has declined by 50% from 2008 to 2016. In fact, in 2010, the first year we sounded the alarm on the opioid crisis in New York City, since then, the number of felony arrests has declined by 47% and commitments to state prison have declined by 40%. The second commonly held belief is that mere opioid possession is usually treated as a felony, which can result in long prison sentences for users and dealers alike. But this, too, uh, ignores some of the changes in the law which date back to 2004, as well as the 2009 sentencing reform. For a first-time felony offender to face a mandatory drug prison sentence on an opioid possession charge in New York State, they have to possess, on average, at least 2,000 glassine envelopes of heroin or fentanyl, and more likely close to 5,000 glassines. Uh, that's not the amount you likely find if you arrest a substance abuser. It's different, of course, if you're charged with the B felony offense of possession with intent to sell, but then you're only facing prison if, um, if you have a prior felony conviction or a prior violent felony conviction. That's because heroin and fentanyl are light substances, and the first uh, narcotics charge, which requires a state felony, um, a state prison sentence, requires that you possess at least four ounces. And the amount of fentanyl that can kill you is measured in grains of salt. And it requires a lot of those grains to make up four ounces. Uh, what, what, sorry, what's the typical, if I'm a heroin addict and I want to buy some heroin, what's the typical amount you're unit buying? of purchase? Well, it, Usually you're buying in glassines. You'll buy, uh, depends on what your level of use is. You might buy more than one bag at a time, depends on how much money you have. So, so how, just weight-wise, since, since these things are measured by weight. Weight, and... grains. I mean, it's measured in, in, a grain is a unit of measure, which, was, you know, it originally corresponds to a grain of wheat. Um, it's an ancient unit of measure, and it's used by jewelers to weigh, um, to weigh gold. Uh, so it's measured in grains, um, and it's uh, half of a grain is typically in a glass scene, um, and I think there are. It, how many of those does it take to make an ounce? Like to make an ounce? Because you you. Were... Uh, there are about 440 grains in a gram, um, so it requires a considerable number of grains uh, to reach. So you'd have to, one would have to have a huge number of glassines yes. to trigger the felony. That's, that's right. That's what you're saying, basically. That's right. Okay, thank you. If you're dealing with heroin, you'll need a lot more because it yes. requires a lot more. In order it's to a lot get, lighter. To get a felony weight on a heroin, but typically on the cocaine, it would be a lot less. Sometimes it will be 20, 30 bags of cocaine. Right. To get to the felony level. To get you at the thank felony you. level. Okay. 
Uh, and the third common belief, and it's easy to see why there is this belief, is that the DAs may not be in favor of treatment. And I just want to make sure that we all understand that we uh, all have treatment uh, programs uh, and my office actually, uh, along with the Brooklyn DA's office, was at the forefront uh, back 30 years ago when they were first uh, conceived. But the problem is highlighted in my written testimony when it shows how few felony drug offenders are going into felony drug court. Um, the, uh, t my written testimony shows that in 2016 in all of New York City, only 441 felony drug offenders went into drug court, felony drug court in New York City. And so it shows, I think, that there's a problem uh, in getting the defendants, the criminal defendants in felony court into those kind of programs. And it's a problem that we really want to think about because historically in New York City, a lot of our uh, people who are being admitted to drug programs were coming from the criminal justice system. And I just don't think you're going to see that happening uh, so much anymore. So we have to think about what are the better ways to do outreach, to bring defendants into treatment. I've looked at these numbers. I've looked at the numbers from OASIS about how many uh, people are entering treatment programs voluntarily. And we see a steep decline during the time of the opioid crisis. So we have to think creatively, as Judge Grasso was testifying, and as you'll hear from the other DAs about the misdemeanor programs, think creatively about how we're going to do that, but it's not all going to come from the criminal justice system. In fact, I think we have to think much more broadly. And I'd love to see the city council and the city uh, really put all your creativity and your commitment behind that to think about those kinds of outreach programs, because I think they are so very important. Um, and so, now that I've um, talked about some of those issues, which some of which affect the challenges that we face uh, at the higher levels when we're looking to build strategic cases to target what we target, which is uh, high volume, coming into the city, a high volume of narcotics coming into the city, um, some of the more potent, some of the more lethal opioids that are killing so many people in the city. Uh, some of the challenges that we face are what I'd like to share with you today. The goal of my office, in conjunction with all of the DAs, uh, as well as NYPD and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the, the, uh, all, all the agencies who work to reduce addiction, overdose, and death, we are looking to reduce, primarily reduce the supply of deadly drugs coming into the city. Our priority targets are the suppliers of the most lethal drugs. So we often spend a lot of time trying to figure out who those people are who those sources of supply are. We always look for the greatest volume and the most violent organizations distributing drugs. We want to seize and destroy the drugs themselves, and we want to appropriately punish those who are profiting from creating this tragedy. So in the eight years we have seen this crisis unfold, we have seen an escalating pattern of ever more dangerous lethal drugs starting with pain pills, followed by heroin, then fentanyl, and now fentanyl analogs, which may be our greatest challenge yet. The fentanyl analogs have basically the same chemical composition as fentanyl, only slightly different. So slightly different, though, that they're not included under the state law that defines fentanyl. And so in order to prosecute cases involving fentanyl analogs, each one of those new analogs has to be added to the state uh, schedule. Now, as you'll see in, on page five of my written testimony, our fentanyl seizures increased by 1,300% last year, 2017 over 2016, and included the nation's largest single seizure of fentanyl 
in um, really nondescript apartment in Kew Gardens, Queens. That was the nation's largest se single seizure of fentanyl. That fentanyl, we believe, was transported um, in connection with the Mexican cartels. And the Mexican cartels are the ones that are responsible for the large volume. It's often mixed in with heroin. And then it is supplied to organizations which package the drugs in big mills, uh, which produce millions of glass scenes pumped out to the city and throughout the East Coast. All that originates here in New York. But one of the things we've noticed about the fentanyl that we're seizing from the cartels is that it is fentanyl. It's not a fentanyl analog. Fentanyl is up to 50 times more powerful than heroin, as you've heard, and the analogs are even more potent, multiple times more potent than fentanyl itself. Uh, and they come into this country in a different way. They originate in China, primarily, and come through the mail, through package delivery service, often ordered in very small amounts, by very diverse criminal organizations. So it's very difficult to find the origin of a supply of a fentanyl analog. It's uh, more like trying to stamp out an army of ants because it's coming in in a relatively large volume. But what we do see is that the deaths tend to be concentrated in certain geographic areas, so that it appears that perhaps a small criminal organization gets a hold of an analog uh, and then distribu distributes it, uh, causing great numbers of deaths in concentrated areas. So we've been looking at that pattern because I believe it is the most challenging pattern that's facing us on the level that my office is working. Uh, SNP and the NYPD are working together to examine the narcotics data, and we've worked very closely with the DA's office. Staten Island provided us with the, some of their overdose data. We've looked at overdose data from the South Bronx. Because what we're looking to do is to identify patterns and trends which will help us find those sources, to develop uh, more systematic ways of identifying sources so that we can reduce the number of deaths. The information that we've analyzed is gleaned from laboratory reports, overdose data, arrests, seizures, and community complaints. And we have developed a detailed understanding of the citywide trends that allows us to synchronize our efforts well with the DAs, with the NYPD, and with the DEA. And most recently, we used these tools to examine fentanyl analogs in New York City's black market. Uh, in a concentrated area, we looked very closely at South Brooklyn and at Staten Island because we had the data for those areas and we had seen a concentrated number of deaths in both of those areas related to these analogs. Uh, and so what we saw is pretty alarming. Now, as I said, the analogs have the same basic chemical composition as fentanyl, but they're more potent. Uh, and although we have identified them and we know they're causing many deaths across the city and state, Many of these analogs have not been added to the state's list of prohibited substances, which creates substantial obstacles to our prosecutions. Uh, obviously, if we arrest somebody for selling it, even if it's killing people, if it's not an illegal substance, much like K2, the problem you saw with K2, we're unable to proceed with that arrest and unable to continue to work up the chain. We may be unable to use wiretaps uh, or search warrants or other tools because those require that you have probable cause to believe a crime is committed. And if selling it, you're not selling a controlled substance, it's not a crime. Now, we've been hampered in some of our efforts, um, but I think our um, our analysis is important for us to consider. We have so far identified at least 48 deaths in Brooklyn South and Staten Island in 2017 that involved four analogs that Governor Cuomo proposed to add to the list of controlled substances in February, and the uh, state legislature did not add those four. Just a quick question. Who, who has to add these analogs to the list? It's the legislature or the State Department of Health? Or? It's the legislature. Really? So each new... That's the problem. Yes. 
I don't, how is it possible to keep up in this day and age? It's not, well, there's another way that's been done. The federal government has what's called a core structure statute where they prohibit any substance that has the same basic core structure. And there have been proposals like that before the state legislature, but they haven't been, um, none of that's been passed. The only thing that the state legislature has done is add kind of one by one as the analogs show up. And you saw this again, it's an issue that's familiar to the city council because you saw it with K2. As they show up one by one and they're identified, they've been willing to add certain of those to the list. Uh, the ones that, I, that they have added have been added to the DEA's permanent list. The ones that they have failed to add are on the DEA's emergency list. And the problem with that is the emergency list tends to reflect the most current trends. Those tend to be the ones that are affecting us right now. And that's certainly true in this instance, when 20% of the deaths that we analyzed in Staten Island and South Brooklyn were caused by four of the analogs, which were rejected for addition to the uh, list of controlled substances. They, they, were, this, they were affirmatively rejected? Like, we're not doing this? Or just well, didn't, they just... added two of the 11 that he proposed, uh -huh. and they rejected the other nine. And of those nine, four of them have shown up yeah, in the tox ME toxicology reports, exactly, uh, as being um, present in the deaths of a good number of people. And so that's the reason for my concern about it. I agree with you wholeheartedly that there's a much better way to do this, uh, which would be adopting something like a core structure type statute. But we haven't been able to get that through, so you know what? We do the best we can, as we always do. So. What I'd like to do is ask for the city's council's support uh, in, uh, in supporting the effort to add these analogs to the list of controlled substances. I'll do a much more comprehensive report. We're only beginning our analysis, but I thought this was an opportune time to bring it to your attention. Uh, and then we'll see across the city which of the analogs are causing, wreaking the most havoc, which are causing the most death, and I would be, uh, I would urge you to add your voices to this because, you know, they're killing people. And we are hamstrung to a certain degree in what we can do about it. So okay. I thank you so much for the opportunity, to the opportunity, for the opportunity to talk about our strategy and what at this time is our priority concern and how we can work closely with the council. And I look forward to working with you on other projects. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, Councilmember Ulrich. Uh, thank you very much to you and your staffs, and it's uh, always an honor to be with uh, my colleagues from across the city to talk about this very important issue. Before I get to my uh, formal testimony, I just want to point something of a number or two out. 1,500, that's how many New Yorkers are likely to die this year from an opioid uh, overdose. That's probably four or five a day. Uh, in my opinion, there is no crisis that comes close, no issue that is as important as this issue right now for the people and those who govern uh, the city of New York. I'm a little, um, uh, what should I say? I don't wanna, it's a little surprising to me, or perhaps not, that next door there are hundreds of people here to testify on a, a hearing about uh, banning straws and someone who once uh, led the sanitation and environmental committees in this council, I understand it's a very important issue. I just wish there were hundreds of people here today. So uh, the, and the, the, the council now has its official recyclable straws. I'm, I'm glad to see I'm not, that. I'm not being whimsical that, with my candy striped straw here. This is, got this is it, what but I, I got. wish that the days were fuller and the, there was more attention brought to this issue because we are on the front line seeing every day uh, that our friends, uh, our neighbors, our relatives, uh, our uh, co-residents of our boroughs uh, and our city are dying every day from this terrible crisis. So I want to thank you for continuing to bring a focus on it. Uh, and although I know that the, the, the topic for today is the, the opioid crisis and the role of the criminal court, uh, I think all of us want to address that but expand just a little bit on the overall strategies that we think are important. Uh, and we, we really thank you for the opportunity for presenting them to you uh, this afternoon. 
As you already know, Staten Island and the city have been combating a deadly opioid and heroin epidemic, which every day continues to claim far too many lives. Sadly, this year on Staten Island alone, there have already been 52 fatal overdoses and an additional 125 naloxone saves. That's one overdose every day and every third day a death. When I took office as Richmond County District Attorney in January of 2016, Staten Island had one of the highest drug overdose rates in the New York City. It seemed like we were losing more lives every week and the crisis showed little sign of receding with the introduction of deadlier substances like fentanyl, which you've heard about, and its numerous analogs. The heroin and opioid epidemic felt as if it had turned into a plague on Staten Island, and as a result, it demanded immediate action. Recognizing the significant challenges facing the borough, I launched a multifaceted response that has expanded the role of local law enforcement and prosecutors, and has given them the tools they need to address the crisis. Those efforts have included prosecuting serious drug dealers, offering treatment and other supportive services to affected individuals and families, and increasing public awareness to re and reducing the stigma of uh, addiction illness through media and educational outreach. Our prosecutorial strategy is to combat the opioid crisis on multiple fronts using various strategies and approaches. We are vigilant in our pursuit of those drug dealers that are peddling this poison and taking advantage of those dealing with the throes of addiction. We are also compassionate enough to understand that there are a number of people who are suffering with the cycle of addiction, and thus we are dealing with the supply side and the demand side of this crisis through justice and mercy. On the supply side, we have increased enforcement efforts and investigative methods through our overdose response initiative which has allowed assistant district attorneys from my office to work side by side with the NYPD and the detectives, of course, and investigate each overdose as they would a criminal crime case, as a criminal case. This is done in an effort to trace back the source of these toxic drugs and hold dealers more accountable. On Staten Island, the ORI has led to dozens of major drug takedowns, as well as the arrest of over 100 drug dealers many of which were directly tied to overdoses. The office has also expanded the number of investigations due to ORI, with 350 investigations opened in 2016 and over 400 that were opened in 2017. And this is compared to just 192 in 2015 before we came in. This successful model is now being duplicated by the NYPD and the other DA offices throughout the city. And when you're little Staten Island, you take pride in that. Currently, uh, this office has no cases pending in response to your question, Mr. Chairman, where we have charged any co-user with the accidental overdose of another person, nor in accordance with New York State's Good Samaritan Law have we charged a co-user with possession or use when they have called in an accidental overdose. But our office is the first in the city of New York to charge a dealer, a death by dealer, with the overdose death of an individual through our overdose response initiative. However, that defendant was not a co-user, but a supplier. And that case is still pending before the court, so I cannot expand further on the facts and or the circumstances of that investigation. And while I'm immensely proud of our success, and I've stayed committed to holding drug dealers accountable, I also recognize that we cannot simply arrest our way out of this problem. And that is why my office has also worked together with groups from across the spectrum of law enforcement, the defense bar, treatment and social service providers, and the Staten Island community as a whole to create the Heroin Overdose Prevention and Education Program, or HOPE. HOPE is the first of its kind diversion program in New York City to redirect low-level drug offenders in Staten Island pre-arraignment to community-based health and treatment services instead of jail and prosecution. And to date, the program has seen tremendous success with approximately 90% of participants having meaningfully engaged in treatment services and their criminal cases withdrawn. I want to thank the council and this administration for being on the forefront of funding the peer monitor mentors who are dispatched to the precinct to meet each individual arrest. These recovery coaches are critical uh, to HOPE's success. 
And through all of our combined efforts last year, Staten Island experienced a 15% decrease in overdose deaths. Almost 400 people have also received treatment services through the HOPE program. And to your question earlier, Councilmember Ulrich, yes, having a peer mentor engage in that program is extremely effective. I am also proud to say that HOPE, like ORI, is being duplicated by my colleagues here today, recognizing the importance of offering treatment early at the moment of arrest. Our office is also moving to expand the HOPE program on Staten Island to reach more people so that no one suffering from addiction is left behind or falls through the cracks. In furtherance of your questions of Judge Grasso, uh, Councilman, we're trying to expand the charges as well in the HOPE program beyond the 2003. At the same time, RCDA has continued to utilize other successful diversion models for hundreds of offenders each year. Staten Island Drug Treatment Court, Drug Treatment Alternative to Prison, and Treatment Accountability for Safer Communities are all programs with the mission to rehabilitate substance abusing offenders in order to improve not only their quality of life, but also that of the Staten Island community by breaking the cycle of crime associated with addiction. At the same time, I also successfully fought and advocated for a full narcotics court part on Staten Island that will handle felony narcotics cases and trials for dealers, treatment court, and compliance for other diversion cases such as task, in essence, a truly full narcotics part. To oversee these initiatives, we have also recently appointed an alternatives to incarceration program coordinator to supervise and expand our efforts. Still, when I was running for this office and when I entered office in 2016, my team and I noticed a significant drop off in people accepting and entering traditional treatment court between 2014 and 2015. 158 people in 2014, down to 60 people in 2015. And this trend continued in 2016 and 2017 with 69 people and 64 people entering treatment court respectively. I was encouraged to hear these numbers confirmed uh, by our great colleague, Bridget Brennan, here this afternoon. This does not mean that prosecutors under the former administration or under my administration made fewer offers of treatment court in these years but rather that less people were willing to accept those offers and participate given the intensity and requirements of the program, and I believe given the nature of the current addiction that people find themselves in. This decline is one of the reasons we created the HOPE program. We recognized that we needed to expand the diversion opportunities to address the spectrum of individuals who would benefit from treatment and behavioral health services instead of incarceration and make these diversion points earlier in the process to steer more individuals towards treatment and away from incarceration and make a greater impact to save lives. As I mentioned above, we are working to expand the HOPE program because we recognize that there is still more that can be done to continue to expand diversion opportunities and capture an even greater universe of participants with addiction illness. With our partners in the courts, we have also begun conversations about expanding the eligibility and varying the requirements of Staten Island Drug Treatment Court to achieve similar ends. Related, we are also working to expand mental health treatment court to include misdemeanor offenses in order to increase the number of people who can be helped by mental health services and as an alternative to incarceration. We have proposed this expansion to the court and to legal aid society and eagerly await their approval and assistance to make this a reality. My office also offers two anti-drug programs to encourage our youth. The Choices and Consequences program uh, in a, is an interactive high school presentation designed to prevent drunk, drugged, and reckless driving, while the No D program is offered to all middle and high schools on Staten Island where assistant district attorneys travel to schools throughout the borough to give anti-drug presentations to youth. We are also actively involved in bringing Too Good for Drugs program into all of the middle and high schools with our terrific partners in the NYPD and borough president Jim Otto. But members of the council, this council has to do more in requiring mandated education programs in our schools because too many young people are making a choice to use these terribly toxic drugs and do not have the, the foundation and education uh, to, to make the right choice at, at a critical time. 
In Staten Island, we've also launched Staten Islanders Against Drug Abuse, a grassroots public awareness campaign aimed at combating the heroin, fentanyl, and opioid epidemic on the island, while also providing resources and help to those battling addiction. The, the initiative includes a one-stop shop website, sihope.org, an online resource designed for those struggling with addiction, those with a loved one struggling with substance abuse, and those that simply want to get involved to help stop the heroin and opioid epidemic in Staten Island. As part of this campaign, more than 3,000 SI Hope lawn signs have been placed in public locations throughout Staten Island to help raise awareness to this serious issue. Additionally, we worked uh, and used asset forfeiture money to install MedSafe drug disposal receptacles at four pharmacy locations on the island, and since last year, we have collected more than 300 gallons of pills, helping to ensure that addictive drugs are thrown away before they fall into the wrong hands. We know that to most effectively combat the drug epidemic, we need a Marshall Plan approach. We must address the supply by aggressively prosecuting those who deal drugs, address the demand by educating our young people of the dangers of drug use, and critically, get those battling addiction into the hands of health professionals who can help them beat their illness. The expansion of drug courts and alternatives to incarceration, including programs like HOPE, or whatever acronym is used, Chairman, must be a key element of any strategy to combat the epidemic in localities across the nation. The old way, jailing those battling addiction for a short stint and sending them back to the streets only exacerbates the existing problem and does little to improve public safety. While there is still much work to be done on Staten Island and, uh, and, and other struggling towns and other parts of the city, the successes we have seen already show that law enforcement must embrace new roles and develop innovative strategies to lead the way. Initiatives like ORI and HOPE work to allow our ADAs to take that, that type of balanced and multi-pronged approach necessary to finally overcome the drug crisis while saving lives and keeping our communities safe. And if I could also just mention uh, that we uh, have had in the HOPE program, I just want to give you those numbers. So since we started uh, a year ago, January, uh, 475 individuals have been offered HOPE, 366 participants have meaningfully engaged and their cases uh, have been withdrawn. Uh, 450 people have been to the resource center for an assessment. Um, 448 people were met by the peer uh, in the precinct and were given naloxone treatment. Um, and um, of those who accepted the program uh, and finished, it's a success rate of 95%. Uh, and just out of what we're very proud of is the results that these people have reached. So not only uh, was their case never docketed and their arrest records sealed, um, but the result that they received, this, the meaningful engagement as defined by the providers, not by me or my office, by the providers. Uh, 30 people have been referred to outpatient treatment programs. Nine uh, have been referred to inpatient treatments. Oh, these are for this year. Hold on. I got better numbers. There we go. Uh, that was just for this year, but for the uh, overrun of the program, 133 people have been referred to outpatient treatment programs. 32 have been referred to inpatient, 16 have been referred to detox, and 32 have been referred to harm reduction programs. So that's taking out of a misdemeanor arrest a very serious outcome, and at the same time, HOPE has immediate contact, immediate diversion, uh, and as I said, a sealing of the arrest record uh, and um, uh, no docketing of the court case. Uh, so I, I thank you uh, for your attention to listening to what we've been doing. Uh, and clearly, uh, there's a great role for the courts to play uh, and for this council to play as our partners in addressing this terrible crisis. Thank you very much. Um, who wants to volunteer to go next? There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. You just, step, just use the microphone, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chairman uh, Lanceman, for giving us this opportunity to be here today to discuss with you um, and highlight for you the strategies that we are employing in the Queens District Attorney's Office 
with respect to prosecution and diver um, with respect to our prosecutorial strategies and diversion strategies to combat the opioid uh, crisis in our county. Obviously, it is our hopes of reducing death and saving lives. Please allow me to just introduce myself and my colleagues who are here with me today. I'm the chief of the Narcotics Trials Bureau in Queens District Attorney's Office, where I've worked since 1990. The Narcotics Trials Bureau, as, I, <clears throat> as the name suggests, concentrates its efforts and resources to combat narcotics-related crimes in Queens County. To that end, our bureau is assigned most of the felony narcotics and felony driving while intoxicated crimes. However, the Bureau handles other types of crimes as well, and they include and are not limited to robbery, assault, attempted murder, and so on. Also with me from our office is Phil Anderson, Supervising District Attorney, Assistant District Attorney from our Narcotics Investigations Bureau, who handles the investigative side of the felony narcotic-related crimes and is the liaison to the NYPD overdose investigation team. Now, our bureaus work in conjunction with Douglas Knight, who many of you may know, who is the director of our alternative sentencing in our office. He has a master's degree <clears throat> in criminal justice and is credentialed, and is a credential alcohol and substance abuse counselor with over 30 years of alternative sentencing experience. Together, we are responsible for the development and implementation of office-wide alternative sentencing programs offered to defendants by our office or the courts. We collaborate with the court and treatment agencies on a daily basis in overseeing all compliance with treatment programs associated with the Queens County criminal justice system. We're proud to say that District Attorney Brown has been and continues to be a leader in diverting both nonviolent and a select few violent off offenders into treatment as a way to assist and address the needs of those whose criminal behavior is motivated by substance abuse, alcohol abuse, or mental health issues. Our office has a wide variety of alternative sentencing programs, particular <clears throat> targeting particular types of offenders, including veterans, DWI offenders, those with mental health issues, and those who have a dual diagnosis. As soon as a case is assigned to, our, to a bureau in the office, a supervisor immediately assesses that case and determines, and, and, and determines whether that defendant or the nature of the crime meets the treatment criteria for some of our specialized courts. He or she then inputs the information into our system, and Mr. Knight, who's the director of our alternative sentences, immediately gets a notification to begin the process of scheduling the defendant for assessment with his counsel if the defendant is interested in this type of treatment. Now, as we're all aware and why we're here today, our nation is facing an opioid crisis, and we're all tasked with the responsibility to address this issue. Too many of our citizens, especially those between the ages of 25 and 54 years of age, are overdosing and dying from the use of opioids, most notably heroin and fentanyl, as has been mentioned here today. As I'm sure you're aware, and as you've mentioned, um, Councilman, over 1,400 um, New York City um, residents died um, in last year from overdose death. Our city excuse me, has seen a significant increase in overdose deaths in 2014, approximately 80%. In 2014, there were only 800 such reported deaths in New York City, according to the Department of Health. And as was stated by many of, uh, by you and our colleagues, we've seen over 1,400 this year. We certainly understand the importance of this crisis and have made efforts to address it. Those efforts include tracking both fatal and non-fatal overdoses, <clears throat> treating each overdose death as a homicide investigation from inception with our writing assistants who are notified immediately by the detective squad and who go to those scenes to ascertain and collect evidence in hopes of continuing with the investigation, coordinating with the NYPD Narcotics Bar of Queens overdose teams and any other agencies, including our staff working group, to offer assistance with investigations in an effort to bring criminal charges against those who sold the drugs or those who supplied the drugs to the decedent. Taking a harsher uh, position on those found to have sold fentanyl, 
We also proffer those arrested, thank you. We also proffer those arrested and charged to ascertain the source and the location of the drugs. And most importantly, we continue to identify those who are substance addicted and offer them treatment in our alternative to incarceration programs or courts, as well as providing literature to educate them about the risk of drug use and making them aware about the use of Narcan. Now, alternative to incarceration programs were established to focus on the increasing number of substance addicted defendants who we began to see in the 90s. Unfortunately, we're still dealing with sub, uh, individuals who are addicted and now we are at a crisis with overdose. We continue to see them appear in our courts on a daily basis. Towards that end, we have a number of programs. The Drug Treatment Alternative to Prison, which is our DTAP program, supported by our District Attorney Brown since its inception in 1993, has had a tremendous success. Now that program was developed for nonviolent second felony drug offenders whose involvement with the criminal justice system stems from their abuse of drugs. Each defendant is screened and assessed to determine whether he or she suffers from an addiction and the extent of that addiction. Before acceptance into our treatment program, which is usually 12 months of court monitoring, the defendant must plead guilty and abide by the court-imposed requirements. The defendant will be monitored through the frequent court appearances to determine whether they are progressing with their treatment and complying with the other requirements. Drug testing is given periodically through the program, and those who successfully complete treatment will be eligible to have their cases dismissed and sealed, or charges reduced, or sentences lowered, and they be given a second chance at life, in essence. However, those who fail will be sentenced to an alternative jail sentence that was negotiated at the time of the plea. This serves as a balance, we believe, in enforcing the law while also tr treating those who need and want help for their addiction. We also believe that a jail alternative in the event of repeated failures serves as a legitimate incentive to get well and not reoffend. Over the years and as a result of the success we've experienced with our DTAP population, we expanded our network of drug treatment diversion programs. In 1998, we launched our Queens Treatment Court, which, as um, Council has indicated, is overseen by Judge Hirsch um, for nonviolent first time felony offenders. It is a unique core part in all. <clears throat> in that all parties operate as a team, the judge, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, various staff members, and treatment providers work together in a collaborative effort. They meet on a daily basis to discuss the defendant's treatment progress and violations and determine the best course of action to take in any given situation. We are proud to announce that we recently celebrated our 20th anniversary which has afforded over 2,000 otherwise jail-bound defendants the opportunity to avail themselves of treatment resources that resulted in charges being dismissed and sealed and a return to productive lives free of substances. Because of our tremendous success with the Felony Treatment Court, in 2002 we launched our Misdemeanor Treatment Court, which concentrates on the recidivist misdemeanor nonviolent drug-addicted population. This court exposes these participants to a structured graduated sanction approach to address the substance abuse issues that they are continually struggling with over the years. The model employed in this court is similar to the felony treatment model. In 2006, we developed a DWI treatment court. This court operates out of the Queens Treatment Court and specifically addresses the underlying alcohol-related issues of DWI offenses. We currently have a recidivism rate of less than 10%. Moreover, a DWI defendant will not receive a dis dismissal upon successful completion. Instead, he or she will be sentenced on a misdemeanor DWI charge and receive probation. We also provide services for those whose criminal behavior is motivated by complicated mental health issues. Among the many services in the, is the Queen's Mental Health Court. The court focuses on the defendants who have mental health issues, especially those having a major depressive disorder. As all of you know, this population is extremely difficult to accommodate, yet we work diligently on a regular basis to provide the necessary services and linkages to allow them to succeed. Now the programs identified above are just a few of the program options offered in Queens County. 
There are numerous other alternative incarceration programs offered on a daily basis, which assist hundreds of defendants in need of clinical services. With respect to the ever-growing opioid concern, we recently launched the Queen's Treatment Intervention Program, also Q-TIP, to specifically address misdemeanor nonviolent individuals addicted to opioids. Q-TIP is a collaborative program with industry leaders Samaritan Daytop Village, an Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, a licensed treatment provider that will clinically engage defendants charged with seventh degree possession of controlled substance under Penal Law Section 22003 and other low-level offenses associated with opioid addiction. In lieu of traditional community service, defendants will plead guilty to disorderly conduct under Penal Law 24020, a violation and not a crime, and will be directed for clinical assessment to determine if further treatment services are warranted. If assessed and not determined to need any clinical services, upon return to court, the case will result in the adjournment of con will, will, will result in an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, also known as an ACD. In the event the defendant is assessed and, the, and determined to be in need of clinical services, but he or she declines these services, the plea to disorderly conduct with, will stand and the defendant will be sentenced to a conditional discharge. If assessed and treatment is recommended and the defendant takes the necessary steps to enroll in services on the following court date, the defendant will receive an ACD. Regardless of the outcome of the case, our goal is to clinically evaluate as many eligible defendants as possible and at the very least plant a seed that professional services exist to address their opioid addiction. It is this population that we believe is most susceptible to overdosing. If we can reach these people in this early stage and connect them to treatment and services, we believe this will help reduce the number of cases resulting in overdoses and death. Since QTIP began, 73 defendants have accepted our offer to participate in the program. Thus far, 79% of those assessed satisfied our requirements, resulting in their casing being ACD. It should be noted that 84% are male, and we have a retention rate of 88%. Furthermore, there is no cost to the defendant associated with Q-TIP, and to serve our diverse constituency, we provide services in all languages, and we will continue to identify other OASIS licensed treatment programs to achieve our desired goals. As stated before, most of these programs have been in existence for several years, and we're simply attempting to expand them. And we're extremely proud of our retention and success rates. Again, these are the programs under which we offer a comprehensive array of treatment services to offenders who have been diverted through specialized courts that assess their treatment needs and then design a treatment plan to address those needs. At this time, the existing alternative to incarceration programs are prepared to link the opioid population to the comprehensive existing services and resources to address their needs. District Attorney Brown is delighted to join in the efforts to provide the needed services. This population is in need of unique outreach, peer support, specialized services, and treatment to further educate them and to avoid the dire consequences associated with drug addiction and opioid use in today's society. In sum, we're glad to be a part of these in innovative alternative sentencing initiatives and welcome any support that will better serve the pressing needs of this deserving and eligible population who suffer from trauma and addiction. We will continue to provide effective professional alternatives to defendants in need of treatment services, and we will continue to link them with the appropriate agencies in our specialized courts. Finally, we encourage any one of you who are interested in visiting our existing initiatives to come and meet with us to learn more about the services we provide. We look forward to meeting with you and keeping you informed of our programs in this innovative and important initiative. We hope that our efforts will go a long way in addressing the opioid crisis and saving lives of Queens residents. Thank you. Thank you. So just let's move on down the line. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Langman and members of the Justice 
uh, system. I am Leroy Fraser, Chief of Staff to the Brooklyn District Attorney, and I am here representing Kings County District Attorney's Office. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about how my office is addressing the opiate crisis in court. I especially am happy to be here today because uh, this is my farewell speaking to the uh, City Council and that uh, I will be retiring in another couple of weeks after almost 38 years of service. The opiate crisis has hit us hard in Brooklyn. In the last five years, we have lost well over 1,000 people to overdose, with the numbers increasing every year. Our priority with regard to opiates is and must be keeping people alive. This means that while we focus enforcement efforts on apprehending major distributors of opioids to interrupt supply chains at a high level, most of our resources must be directed to prevention and treatment. To interrupt the supply chain, our office conducts targeted long-term narcotics investigations in conjunction with other law enforcement agencies. When successful, these investigations reveal large-scale networks consisting of suppliers, wholesale dealers, and their workers, as well as stash locations and recovery both of their stockpile product and the proceeds of their illicit activity. The individuals behind these large-scale narcotics operations tend to contribute to the shootings and violence that we see in Brooklyn so apprehending these drivers of crime has the dual effect for the moment of cutting off a source of dangerous narcotics and removing violent criminals from the streets. Nevertheless, with respect to street level dealers, we realize that each individual seller who is arrested and taken off the street is immediately replaced with someone else who is willing to risk arrest and incarceration to make money, providing a product for which there is an unceasing demand. And in many cases, these street level sellers are themselves addicted to substances they sell. So for these individuals, we take a nuanced approach to their cases. Under New York penal law, if a person shares heroin or another drug with another person, it can be considered a sale of narcotics. It is not our policy to prosecute as a seller someone who has merely shared drugs with another user. Moreover, we are not inclined to prosecute as sellers individuals who are merely steerers, that is, who direct an undercover, for example, to a seller, though that too could be considered selling under an acting in concert theory of the penal law. Finally, we see cases sometimes in which an undercover asks an individual to buy narcotics for them. The undercover gives the individual money, the individual procures the drugs for the undercover, and in exchange, the undercover may give a person a tip or a form of, uh, in the form of cash or a portion of the drugs, and then arrest that individual for selling. Our office policy is to evaluate these cases on an individual basis. However, going forward, we will endeavor to carve out those cases where the exchange is motivated by an individual's addiction as opposed to merely selling for a profit. One question that has been posed is whether our office would prosecute for homicide someone who sold drugs on which a buyer later overdosed and died. While there is a possibility that an appropriate case might at some point present itself, District Attorney Gonzalez recognizes that the causes of drug use and overdose are complex and involve a certain amount of free will on the part of the user, and that charging a seller with homicide will not be appropriate in a lot of cases. Nor does District Attorney Gonzalez favor laws that create a new category of homicide as a result of death from overdose. Our investigations have, however, revealed that, a high, that high level dealers are often aware that their product contains fentanyl, which can cause death by overdose. Therefore, a factually appropriate case could result in a homicide investigation. The level of, that level of callousness in the appropriate case could rise to a depraved indifference to a human's life that would justify a homicide prosecution. 
but in general, we normally would not seek to charge a low-level seller of opiates with an homicide. We understand that the supply-side enforcement responses alone will not solve the opiate crisis. We cannot arrest or charge or incarcerate our way out of this problem. We believe that drug misuse is and should be treated as a health issue rather than a criminal issue. And this is not something that we in law enforcement can do on our own. We must work with public health professionals, medical providers, treatment and other service providers, and members of the community to solve this problem. Our Brooklyn Clear program is the best example of our approach to opiate use. And here I have to stop and thank Chairman Lankman and the members of this committee for your tremendous support in helping us to obtain funding for CLEAR during the recent budget negotiations. As you know, money for CLEAR was not in the mayor's original proposal, and you went all hands on deck to make sure that we got the funding to be able to offer this crucial treatment option. We are deeply grateful to you for stepping up on our behalf and on behalf of the people of Brooklyn who are suffering and who need this program. CLEAR is a pre-charge diversion program modeled on Staten Island's HOPE program, but we go a little further, we think. We provide services to people arrested and eligible for a desk appearance ticket on all non-marijuana drug charges, not just opiates, and we do not screen out people with criminal records. In fact, we believe that these people who are most in need of the services and treatment options that the program provides. Here at how it works. When an individual is arrested on a drug charge, typically 220.03 of the penal law, and is found to be DAT eligible, NYPD notifies our office and we dispatch peer counselors directly to the precinct. The peer counselor explains that if the person is accessed by a case manager, before the return date, which is seven days from the date of arrest, they do not have to appear in court. If arrested, if the arrested individual then meaningfully engages in the recommended services, we are chosen jointly between the arrested person and the case manager, those services, I mean. Within the next 30 days, the office will decline to prosecute the case and the case will be dismissed and sealed. The peer counselor also trains the arrested person on how to use an naloxone and gives the person a kit, whether or not they accept the program. This program, which was initially funded in Brooklyn by a grant from City Council under the previous speaker, was initially piloted in six precincts in Brooklyn South, where there were the greatest number of overdoses and where we perceived the need to be greatest. Last month, we expanded the program to the rest of Brooklyn South and with the additional funds we secured from CLEAR in this process, as a result of your advocacy on our behalf, we will be expanding CLEAR throughout the borough over the summer. CLEAR is a pre-charge diversion program. An individual who meaningfully participates in CLEAR will never see the inside of a courtroom on that case. For cases that are not eligible for CLEAR and do not end up in court, our office offers additional opportunities for diversion into treatment and other programs. Again, we believe that drug misuse is a health issue, not a criminal issue, and so the goal is to divert those cases out of the criminal justice system at the earliest point. So in addition to CLEAR, our office offers several other treatment programs, Brooklyn Treatment Co Court for felony drug offenders, misdemeanor treatment court for misdemeanor drug offenses, screen treatment enhancement part for nonviolent non-drug offenders, and DTAP for nonviolent predicate felons. For those who serve our country through military service, specialized treatment for addiction is offered in both our misdemeanor and felony veterans courts. An important point to make is that going forward, our office will increasingly take a harm reduction approach to drug cases. We will not insist on a complete abstinence from all drug use as a condition of being accepted to, into or remaining in the program. We won't automatically recommend terminating someone from in a program or put them, them in jail for their failure to remain abstinent. We understand that addiction to be a chronic relapsing condition that setbacks are part of recovery process, 
and that we know that complete abstinence is the ultimate goal, and we wish that everyone who is addicted to drugs will get off them. However, we realize that that goal is unrealistic for many people, and we no longer see it as our job to enforce abstinence through criminal sanctions. Similarly, in our treatment courts, we intend to greatly reduce the extent to which we require an individual to plead guilty in order to access treatment or other services. We believe that this approach, long the cornerstone of the treatment model in Brooklyn and many other jurisdictions around the country, sets people up for failure, increases incarceration, has severe consequences for non-citizens, and is simply ineffective as a way of solving the problem we face. Offering pre-plea treatment option is one of the recommendations we received from our office's Justice 2020 Committee, which the district attorney formed in January to recommend ways to increase public safety while reducing incarceration. In addition to the programs we offer for those who are arrested for drug offense crimes in Brooklyn, we are always looking for creative ways to deal with this issue, to engage with the community, and get in front of this enormous challenge that we face. Our office is an active participant in the RX stat led by Chauncey Park of the New York County District Attorney's Office and the New Jersey New York HIDA, and we commend him for his leadership and for the creative approach he has taken on these issues. District Attorney Gonzalez recognizes that a major reason for the opiate crisis we now face is the overprescribing of lawful per pres prescription opioids by doctors. Pharmaceutical manufacturers misled these doctors about the addictiveness and dangerousness of their drugs. And so our office was happy to join with the New York State Attorney General in suing the pharmaceutical companies responsible for creating and marketing these drugs. Substance use disorder is a chronic relapsing disease that requires a lot of support to overcome. Cycling someone through the criminal justice system only exacerbates that, the disease by cutting them off from the tools they, ne they need to have any chance at success. Our office is committed to treating the diverse, non-punishing the person suffering from the disease. Our behavioral health approach is in keeping with our office's vision of keeping Brooklyn safe and strengthening the community trust by ensuring fairness and equal justice for all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Lansman and members of this committee. My name is Aisha Green, and I am the chief of the Alternatives to Incarceration Bureau at the Bronx County District Attorney's Office. On behalf of District Attorney Clark, who apologizes that she could not be here today, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak to you about her office's response to the opioid crisis in the Bronx. Upon taking office in 2016, District Attorney Clark made tackling this public health crisis one of her top priorities. Home to 1.4 million people in 2016, Bronx County had the second highest rate of overdose deaths with 376 fatalities. If the Bronx were a state, we would have the 15th highest overdose rate in the country. We ranked higher than large states such as Florida, New Jersey, California, and our own home state, New York. But this problem has been around for 40 plus years and is not a new epidemic in our county. The average person that overdoses in the Bronx is 46 years old and has been arrested seven and a half times for drug possession. This signifies that the Bronx's population is much different than our bordering counties and our population of users is older and more experienced than in other areas. Moreover, in 2017 in the Bronx, a total of 2,405 arrests were made for criminal possession of a controlled substance in the seventh degree. District Attorney Clark believes this provides our office with 2,405 opportunities to intervene and potentially save a life. Based on that philosophy, our office has developed a four-pronged strategy to reduce the number of overdoses in Bronx County entitled Operation Heat, heroin education and access to treatment. These prongs include prosecution, diversion, coordination, and research, and outreach. At base, we must remove the supply of illegal narcotics and opioids lining our streets. To that end, we are working with our partners, including the New York City Police Department, the Drug Enforcement Administration, 
Homeland Security Investigations, the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, and other local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies to investigate and prosecute individuals and groups who illegally manufacture and distribute opioids and other narcotics in the Bronx. These investigations go beyond the typical street-level drug trade and work to dismantle high-level drug trafficking rings that pose a danger to the Bronx and the New York City more broadly. But supply reduction is only half of that puzzle. District Attorney Clark is committed to providing access to treatment for justice-involved individuals with substance use issues, especially those at high risk for opioid overdose. This commitment extends beyond creating typical drug treatment courts and ensures a continuum of care at all touch points, attempting to remove barriers and collateral consequences associated with the criminal justice system. First, District Attorney Clark is on the forefront of diversion programming and currently operates one opioid-based diversion program and a second is in planning. In partnership with Bronx Administrative Judge George Grasso, the Office of Court Administration, and the Center for Court Innovation, the District Attorney developed OR, which is short for Overdose Avoidance and Recovery. This court-based pre-plea diversion program is designed to divert individuals that are high utilizers and are at high risk for overdose away from the criminal justice system and into treatment. This program is available to all individuals arrested for simple drug possession in the Bronx. What is different about this diversion program is that we effectively pause the criminal case and allow individuals to access treatment in lieu of criminal prosecution. Indeed, the defendant is offered connections to treatment pre-plea, and this allows providers to develop a treatment plan that suits their needs without the hammer of a promised sentence forcing defendants into treatment. If they meaningfully engage in this plan, then the Bronx District Attorney's Office dismisses and seals this case. If the individual doesn't meaningfully engage or decides that they do not want to, to complete the OR program, the office returns their case to the regular case processing track without prejudice and we will make the offer that they would have received at arraignment. In the six months that we have been operating, we have gauged, engaged over 150 people in treatment. Uh, and just last week, as Judge Grasso uh, testified earlier, a middle-aged man who uh, works as a cab driver successfully completed the program. It was a long road, but with his wife by his side at every court appearance, he was able to meaningfully engage and successfully complete treatment. He is just one of 29 examples of lives saved in this short period. Also, thanks to City Council and the Mayor for making funding available, we are currently planning HOPE, which stands for Heroin Overdose Prevention and Education. This initiative is designed to combat the heroin and opioid epidemic by diverting low-level substance use offenders into treatment at the time of arrest. First implemented in Staten Island, the HOPE program uses trained peers to meet arrestees at the precinct in an attempt to immediately connect people to resources. These peers walk individuals to treatment and harm reduction services. If after a period of time, the defendant meaningfully engages with the peer and makes a connection to a community-based organization, the office will decline to prosecute the case. These diversion and treatment alternatives only work if we are identifying individuals most at risk for overdose and in need of care. As such, through a partnership with New York University's Marin Institute, the District Attorney's Office developed a tool to identify individuals at high risk uh, for high utilization and overdose in the Bronx. The tool, which consists of five questions, will be validated in late 2018 should funding become available and is being piloted in one of our two diversion programs. Our efforts and activities must be coordinated to ensure that we are reaching our intended audiences and that our efforts are not duplicative. In summer 2017, the Bronx District Attorney launched a working group modeled on District Attorney Vance and Haida Director Chauncey Parker's RxDAT in an effort to create coordinated responses to the opioid crisis. The Bronx Opioid Working Group brings together an interdisciplinary group of stakeholders including public safety and public health professionals to establish consistent, timely, and accurate analysis of opioid overdoses. The working group provides a forum for partners to review shared data in order to craft responses, discuss emergent finds, and coordinate related policy efforts or program activities. The working group helps to reconcile different missions of public health and public safety agencies by adopting a data-driven focus on information sharing. The group has been influential in assisting with the creation of Bronx OR and HOPE programs, which I have already mentioned. 
In addition, through, our, through a partnership with Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, the Bronx District Attorney's Office just completed a needs assessment to identify factors contributing to this crisis, including treatment access, the continuum of care, and prevention strategies. This assessment provides re recommendations for strategies to improve access to opioid use disorder treatment, initiatives that can support individuals through their recovery and beyond, as well as strategies to improve and expand existing prevention efforts. Furthermore, the report will help share, excuse me, furthermore, the report will help shape the Bronx Opioid Working Group and the Bronx District Attorney's efforts moving forward. And finally, getting the message out about the dangers of opioids and fentanyl is necessary to saving lives. Through District Attorney Clark's Strategic Enforcement Division and Community Affairs Unit, she is working to educate the public about the risk of opioid overdose. The office participates in town halls throughout the county and provides speakers at community meetings to discuss this important issue, and we are exploring new ways to prevent overdoses and outreach to the public about the dangers associated with opioids and other substances. We hope that this multifaceted strategy, which focuses equally on demand and supply reduction, will help stem the number of overdoses and improve public safety in the Bronx. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you. I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Lansman and Councilman Ulrich. Um, my name is Chauncey Parker, and I'm an executive assistant district attorney uh, and, a, and a senior policy advisor to Manhattan DA, Cy Vance. And I also um, serve as the director of the New York, New Jersey High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program, or HIDA, um, which is a federal grant that invests in um, federal, state, and local partnerships to build safe and healthy communities. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about DA Vance's strategy to combat the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic is one of the worst public health crises in American history. Uh, and in New York, as my colleagues and um, Chairman, you noted last year with 14 and 141 fatal overdose deaths, uh, there were more than twice as many New Yorkers last year, far more than twice as many New Yorkers, who died of a fatal drug overdose than murders, motor crash, motor uh, vehicle collisions combined. In response to this opioid crisis, DA Vance has launched and expanded several initiatives, focusing on one goal, and that is helping our communities to be safe and to be healthy. To increase the safety of our communities, we're utilizing an intelligence-driven strategy, focusing our prosecutorial efforts on individuals who sell the most lethal drugs, uh, in particular fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. And to increase the health of our communities, we're focused on the care and recovery of individuals suffering from substance use disorders. These efforts include investing in diversion programs, such as creating the city's first alternative to incarceration, or ATI unit, in 2016. This unit identifies treatment and programs that could serve as effective diversion options, as well as helping to identify defendants who can benefit from these programs without compromising public safety. The ATI unit has enhanced our office's institutional capacity to evaluate programs, encourage their utilization, and monitor their effectiveness. Last year, DA Vance also announced the creation of the Manhattan HOPE program aimed at diverting cases for those charged with misdemeanor drug possession and connecting people to services to harm reduction and rapid engagement. Manhattan Hope, which is modeled after DA McMahon's um, program, Hope, uh, pairs high need individuals with peer navigators at the point of arrest to better facilitate access to treatment and other services. Upon completion of the program, we will decline to prosecute those criminal cases. Uh, the other side of Hope, as Judge um, Grasso um, spoke about, is that Hope is a pre arrest. Um, uh, pre-arraignment diversion program uh, or is a post-arrest diversion program and we're working um, with the Bronx District Attorney's Office with Judge Grasso uh, and, um, and our partners in Manhattan to explore expanding that um, to Manhattan. More broadly, the Manhattan DA's office also funds and participates in a diversion program called Project Reset. In 2015, 
the Office developed Project Reset, a pre-arraignment diversion program for people arrested of, for low-level offenses in partnership with the Center for Court Innovation and the NYPD. Given the success of Project Reset, with a 98% completion rate for teens, the office recently expanded the program to adults of all ages and expanded its partners to include the Osborne Association and Young New Yorkers. As part of a suite of program offerings, Project Reset participants can be trained on naloxone administration and receive a naloxone kit to carry with them at the end of the training. In addition, uh, we are also collaborating with the Office of Court Administration um, to expand resources for our Manhattan Drug Court by funding uh, an addiction psychiatrist and social workers to help the judge uh, in court make treatment decisions, as well as uh, the DA has invested in expanding resources um, to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, and the Office of the, of the Medical Examiner by funding epidemiologists uh, and, and data analysts. Another significant drug policy investment made by DA Vance is RxSat, which some of my colleagues have spoken about. It's a groundbreaking public health, public safety partnership to reduce overdoses. When it comes to public safety, New York City has proven that when people work together toward a common goal, anything is possible. New York City RxSat is a public health, public safety partnership which applies the same data-driven, evidence-based, ideologically agnostic principles of CompStat to drug policy. The goal of RxStat, of Rx the North Star of RxStat, is to save lives and reduce overdoses. Over the past few years, RxStat has expanded from a handful of representatives sitting around a conference room table to a monthly meeting that hosts more than 80 senior representatives from 25 key federal, state, and local agencies, including uh, the five New York City District Attorney's Office, the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, the NYPD, the Department of, Mental, of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the two United States Attorney's Offices, Eastern District and Southern District, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the New York City Department of Probation, the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, the New York City Fire Department, the Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, and the New York City Department of Homeless Services. All of these agencies are working together like CompStat, looking at the same map at the same time with the same goal. Last year, New York City launched the next phase of RxStat called Operational RxStat which is hosted every three months at the NYPD at the Jack Maple Comstat Center. At Operational RxStat, which is co-chaired by the NYPD, DOHMH, and HIDA, partner agencies review, or, or tabletop, case studies of fatal overdoses to identify opportunities where, working together, we can save lives in the future. RxStat has been featured at numerous national conferences as a model for public health and public safety collaboration to reduce overdoses. The opioid epidemic is one of the most daunting challenges we have ever faced. But we have faced daunting challenges before, and we know as New Yorkers that nothing is impossible, especially when we work together and we focus like a laser on our North Star. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about DA Vance's vision for how to combat the opioid epidemic, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was a, a, a marathon session of prosecutors. Um, so let me ask a, a few general questions. Um, and I'm sure at this point, everyone is self-motivated to be brief. Just f for, the, for the counsel that, that we're not prosecutors or, or, or doing this work day to day, um, just the division of labor between the district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor, especially as it relates to prosecuting opioid cases. Wh which, which cases get sent to you? What kind of cases get sent to you and what kind of stay with the, the DAs? Uh, we tend to get the higher level um, uh, cases that cross county borders. The, I would say those would tend to be the ones that would come to us. We work a lot with the DEA 
we have jurisdiction over both of the, the Eastern District and the Southern District, so sometimes our uh, citywide jurisdiction is greatly um, a, of great assistance in those cases. Um, D.A. McMahon once characterized it as we're the Air Force and, you're, you, and they're the infantry, um, which is a nice way of looking at it. Uh, we work very closely with each of the D.A.'s offices, though, because each one has different challenges and different ways they want to utilize us. Uh, and we have DAs from each of the offices in my office. So, it, you know, I hate to put it this way, but it kind of depends on what they want. And how do the cases come to you? Do, does, does a DA office have to say, okay, this is a special narcotics case, or? No. Um, doesn't work quite that way, but when, when it, well, it sort of does, in that if we have a case that develops, Whichever county it crosses over in, we have a discussion with that county about whether or not, you know, how we're going to work that case, whether it's appropriate to work it together, whether we're going to take it, whether they're going to take it. So the case uh, may come to us through one of the enforcement agencies, but we always then contact the um, whichever DA's office is involved. Right. Now, I, there's someone from Mock J here, right? So I have some questions. It might be useful for you to, to, to come up now and just, yeah, no folding chair or whatever. Because we, we, we want to understand um, the police department's focus on opioid cases, and the PD is not here today. But it relates to administration policy. Where do you get your cases from? Are they are they from the police department make arrest and they bring it to you? What percentage, if you could even talk about it in those terms, are the result of your own your office's own sort of in, in investigations, and um, and and then the collaboration between your offices and the U.S. Attorney's offices? What can you what can you tell us about about those things. Whoever whoever wants to take it, I, I would I would just say that most of the cases that are on street arrests obviously uh, come from NYPD, but we also have specialized bureaus within our offices, such as our Violent Criminal Enterprise Bureau or Gang Unit or something like that, that generate uh, investigations when you're going after the major dealers. Uh, now, in terms of cooperation with the U.S. Attorney's Office, there are times when, uh, for, when you're doing a drug case, you, you do it, you dex it or you look to see whether or not somebody else is looking at it. And if the U.S. Attorney's looking at it, you have a conversation in that, uh, on those particular cases. But it, again, it's a variety of, uh, of means in which a uh, case is generated. But normally, where someone does an investigation, they have uh, significant contacts with it, that office is going to go ahead and move forward on that case. And I would just add to that, our cases come in, a lot come in from the NYPD. We work with the DEA with other federal enforcement agencies. We generate some of our own cases, particularly in the area of prescription drug investigations. We have our own investigators who work that case as we work with specific analysts within our office. We work with the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement in the State Health Department. Uh, and we do have crossovers with the U.S. Attorney's offices. Sometimes it makes more f sense for them to take a case even if we've done most of the underlying work because they either have better jurisdiction for it, more appropriate statutes. We've done that sometimes um, in some of the, there was one particular case involving a number of basically pill mill clinics throughout the city. And they had, um, we worked on a couple of the clinics along with the Brooklyn DA's office, Astromed, uh, and then the U.S. Attorney's Office had already been developing another case, so then we joined forces and they ended up taking the case after we made some of the arrests. So it just, um, it, you know, it, it's uh, idiosyncratic somewhat in our office. Okay, can I? Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead, no, come no, no, you. I was just going to add that uh, with the advent of the Overdose Response Initiative or the Overdose Task Forces, uh, there's a, str a very strong coordination, I think, between our offices now and the, uh, the detective bureaus, the narcotic detective bureaus, because a lot of the investigations are beginning fr from connecting those dots and 
doing some on the street things and going all the way up to a wire investigation. So uh, that's an added uh, tool in the kit. But there, depending on the tools being used, the interplay or the cooperation between or amongst our offices is on a case by case basis. And I would agree with mostly what everyone said because in Queens we get most of our cases come from the NYPD. And as you know, we also have the airport in, in our county. So the feds typically don't take those cases and they they um, release them to us, and so we end up prosecuting those cases from the airport, unless they're large seizures and the feds take them, the so, rest of those cases So let me ask, and I know you're eager to answer, but uh, what, what are the cases that the feds are, are taking? Um, I know that their resources are vast compared to, to yours, if I'm not mistaken. The special narcotics prosecutors look at me like I'm, I'm, I'm crazy, so maybe I'm uh, maybe they, I they just have fewer. They have fewer attorneys than you know. In our offices, among us, we have thousands of attorneys. That they actually have fewer prosecutors. The federal agencies, the investigatory agencies, are are big and they're numerous and they have big jurisdiction. Um, and but just in terms of absolute numbers, they actually have fewer numbers. They indict fewer cases every year. I guess, I guess what I meant is when, when they decide to make literally a federal case of something, right. they can throw an enormous amount of resources at it. Is, right. is that a fair description? Not that it's relevant for no, anything No, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think, you know, the cliche, it's a, it's a federal case or it's not a federal case, actually has some meaning. Right. Yes. And so what kind of cases do they take? And, I, and I'm interested in the context of, you know, they have laws available to them that we don't, that you all don't have, if I'm not mistaken, a specific federal crime to, to deal and, and cause injury or a serious injury or, or death. So w which cases are they doing? Is it, is it, is it possible to categorize? Yeah. Uh, I, I can't say across the board. They have certain threshold limits uh, when it comes to taking um, narcotics cases, for example, they would take only, as, as was mentioned, the larger amounts. When it comes to taking a death case where someone died in connection, um, I just haven't seen that many of them. Uh, there's only one I can think of that I, that I became aware of. Uh, the death happened in Manhattan. And initially, I think it was brought to the police department. There was some underlying investigation, and then that was uh, taken by the federal prosecutor. But that doesn't happen with great frequency that I'm aware of. That particular set of circumstances doesn't. Uh, there was recently a case where a teacher, who was a teacher in the Bronx, uh, overdosed in the school. He came from Putnam County and started with the overdose response initiative, and then the feds did take the case, and they, right. did, they are prosecuting that case. Um, so that's one. What I've seen is they're also very interested when, with, with the pill cases, right, with the doctors that you, it depends sometimes on the are, case. Yeah, sometimes they are, sometimes mm -hmm. they are. That one in the Bronx, I, I read about it. It was, it was written up. Who, who's getting prosecuted there? The person, whoever sold him the, the drugs? Yes, the dealers. The dealers, and, and they're being prosecuted for homicide. I believe what it is, under federal law, there's a sentencing enhancement if someone sells drugs mm -hmm. and a death results, uh, then I believe there's a substantial sentencing enhancement. 20 years, is that? Right. It's substantial. Right. Minimum 20 years. So, so just a couple of questions for Mock Jan. Sorry, I've got to swear you in. You ready? Sure. <laughs> Raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. I hope you even know the answers to these questions. But um, a large part of the mayor's um, opioid, uh, um, addressing the opioid crisis agenda is, is, is law enforcement. Can, can you tell us what kind of increase there has been in, let's say, I don't know, the number of detectives who are devoted to investigating um, these kinds of cases? And, and whether or not it's, it's city policy, it, it may be each DA's office's policy, I mean, I want to ask about that, to treat each opioid death as a, as a homicide. So I, I'm, good afternoon, mm -hmm. <laughs> Chairman Lansman. My name is Erin Pelnick, Councilor Ehrlich. Um, my name is Erin Pelnick. I'm the Deputy Director of Crime Strategies at Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, I think as to the specific number of increase in 
NYPD detectives. I think it's best suited for NYPD to answer, but I'd be happy to follow up after this hearing with the specifics of that request. Um, if the latter question is, is whether it's NYPD's policy to investigate every overdose fatal incident as a homicide investigation, I think it's more in the in the language that's being used, I don't think that means that they're treating every overdose fatality as a homicide. But I think what they're meaning is they're, that kind of shows the commitment that PD is making in investigating mm. these incidents. And I'm going to defer it obviously to the, to the prosecutors who are here um, who work in partnership with NYPD in these incidents. So, so b before you answer that, and I want you to, I just want to put, lay down the, the, the framework. There is concern, and I, you know, I don't know how valid it is, that um, if you treat every investigation like a homicide investigation, you are going to result in more homicide prosecutions. Now, I don't know if that's true, but you know, there's something to the case that if you view you know, yourself as a hammer, every problem is going to look like a nail. Well, I don't necessarily believe that, um, Councilman. I believe why we treat those cases as homicides is so that we can go out and gather intelligence and information with those who are, especially those that are saves, we then um, are able to speak with those victims, ultimately our family members obtain their phones in an effort to find out where the drugs are coming from, how did they get these drugs, so that we can then um, um, put in, in, in intelligence towards locating the dealers, locating who are selling them, and also, in terms of um, identifying those people who were saved and offering them treatment, at, at least ident um, getting them access to treatment and keeping our database so that if they end up in our system, we know of what type of disposition and how to treat them. We know that this is someone who had a prior overdose situation and therefore they should be connected to treatment services as quickly as possible, as well as um, using them in an effort to gain intelligence to continue to um, investigate and hopefully bring a case against those who were selling the substance that led to either the accidental overdose or the fatal death. So you all vigorously shook your, your heads. I think that's a, a fair representation of your head movements in response to my statement. But go ahead. Dad, they're not treated like a homicide scene. It's treated like a crime scene. Right. And that's an investigation is done. I think that, that sort of, that, that helps clarify it. Okay. In addition. Yeah. So, so it, rather just for the sake of time. Is it, is it fair to say that the fact that these overdoses may be treated as a, as a homicide investigation or a crime scene doesn't necessarily indicate a desire on any of your office's parts to start treating, uh, to treat these um, overdoses, uh, to bring, bring homicide charges Not in these kind of circumstances? Saves. So just, I, you gotta I'm sorry. Talk. Well, our, our goal is not to criminalize the person who overdosed and is saved, or, but to find um, evidence to ultimately cut off the supply, as we've all talked about. So it is certainly, um, fru uh, the, the scene is an area that evidence exists it, by way of their phone, by way of talking to their friends, um, by way of talking to family members, so that we can ascertain who the individual has been in contact with, um, who, if they know, have been supplying them the drugs that they've been no, I get, taking. I get it. I understand that. And, 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 and you said that. So, so maybe, I sh maybe I shouldn't have tried to, to, to shorten it, but, but we wanna, we're interested in knowing. Yeah. I, I, I think the, um, I mean, the best answer is if we're going to bring homicide charges, we have to, uh, we have to meet the standards required by law. And we've brought two homicide cases against two doctors right. who had multiple so let's, deaths. So at this point, let, let's do that. If each of you can tell me what your office is. Yeah, which and that's homicide? it for us. Right. Uh, just two homicide cases against two doctors. One was just affirmed by the first department where they again articulated what the standard of criminal uh, recklessness is regardless of what the manner of death is. It was people v. Lee, and it was just affirmed this past fall. That doctor was convicted in connection with three deaths, and um, he's serving 10 years. Got it. If, if you, just for each of your offices, have you brought any homicide cases against? Uh, 
dealers or, or others sure. to being responsible for the death of someone else. Thank you. The Bronx County District Attorney's Office has not brought those charges. Manhattan DA um, has not brought those charges. I just want to add one thing. If there are 1,400 fatal overdoses last year, you can probably count on one hand the number of, how many, whether federal or state, that were done. I think people are very carefully um, deciding whether to use that. I think what's happening, I think which is very important, is that these overdose deaths, you're getting, not just you're getting the police, you're getting the prosecutors, you're also getting partners at Rikers, you know, the doctors at Rikers Island. We're really looking at this as, is there an opportunity here or not? It may lead to a criminal case, but you can count on one hand when it actually does lead to a criminal case. You're also leading to defects in our system where we could possibly save lives in the future. Like what was the release plan from Rikers Island? What happened at this homeless shelter? What happened in criminal court? Is there anything we could have done differently? That kind of scrutiny, I think we want to welcome that the four corners of government is right on top of these cases to identify opportunities. Not rarely is it a criminal case, but they're really treating it seriously. And uh, to add to that, when the cases of overdose saves, um, the city has a program, we have it in St. Island as well, where peers are dispatched to try to, in, to talk to that person, to try to navigate them into it. It's such a valuable tool. I, I hope you will not leave this hearing thinking that the overdose response initiative or the task force uh, investigations are uh, trying to criminalize something further than it exists. It's a very effective tool in going after the supply, but also the demand. And we're going to try to use that data to go even further and establish outreach programs that go to these individuals and try to get them help, like happens now with uh, domestic violence cases. It's a very valuable tool. That being said, in Staten Island, we do have one prosecution uh, that arose out of the overdose response initiative, but also many other investigative tools that gave us the probable cause to charge someone uh, for manslaughter um, above and beyond what happened in just that investigation. But our goal in investigating these cases is to go after the dealers, uh, but for dealing and to, to cut down that supply, but also in the case of the saves, to help those individuals and try to give them, give them an outreach. And that is in partnership with the administration. Right. Look, you, you each, I don't, I'm gonna get to you, I just wanna, wanna say, look, you're, you each either are or represent independently elected officers. You're responsive to the public in the same way that we are. So you don't, you don't need me to tell you what the public wants, right? But from the council's perspective, I think, um, we certainly don't think that people want to see uh, dealers or sharers or co-users prosecuted for homicides, except in the most truly egregious, and somebody had used the word callous, circumstances. We, we don't want to see happening here what what the New York Times reported is happening around the country. And I'm not saying that we see that, but we want to just kind of get that out there in the open. I, I think we agree, but I, I'll just say that uh, without talking about a specific case, I think we will agree if someone callously and knowingly pervades a very deadly product to someone and knows that it's deadly and does it and knowingly, and that can be proven uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, I, I think that case should be prosecuted. But otherwise, in the normal course of things, none of us, as, as I know them all, intend to do that. But again, this tool that we're using by investigating these overdoses not only allows us to go after dealers, help individuals need help, ha uh, give help to the families who've lost a loved one or have a fam someone who's in crisis, and gives us real-time public health data as to what's going on in our borough so that if there is a bad batch out on the streets, we can sound an alarm to people to say there's, you know, given the, on heat maps or indexing that there, uh, the, uh, data analysis that there is a crisis out there, it is a very, very valuable tool. And so I, I just want to make sure, uh, Councilman, that the, the, that the panel understands that there is so much benefit to this and it is not geared to investigate homicide scenes, it's treated like a crime scene to gather evidence to allow us to do our jobs. Yes, uh, uh, as you said, I think it was I who's, who used the term callous. Uh, D.A. Gonzalez feels that it, it would be a very uh, particularized set of facts and circumstances that would warrant the homicide prosecution. Uh, as uh, D.A. McMahon just said, I, I, he made me think of I know of at least one instance where uh, on a wiretap we overheard uh, someone saying that uh, they knew 
that there was fentanyl laced uh, uh, heroin that was causing the problem, and they pulled it back. So I, can, I would foresee that it would be uh, difficult. It's a very high standard to meet, but uh, again, our approach is to do, uh, go after uh, the opioid use as a public health hazard. I would just like to as it relates to And just, just to confirm, Brooklyn hasn't had any no. coordinated homicide cases. Good. I would like to say that Queens does not have any um, homicide um, cases either. However, we did, uh, we, we, we did um, bring several cases as a result of the overdose team and the information that was obtained from those seen by utilizing undercovers once they got the information to then um, conduct buys that led into us um, arresting actual dealers. As I say, we're looking for dealers who are actually dealing, not someone who is also a substance abuser just trying to make a buck with someone, but someone's actually dealing the substance that we believe is causing people to die. And so we, we had several of those cases that we successfully prosecuted um, with respect to charging them with selling the drugs um, based upon additional and, uh, and investigation. In those, and in those cases, you had made a determination that they for want of a better, for, those, are, those are dealers in the those business of dealers. dealers. They're yes. not, They weren't um, ad addicts or, you know, a co- Bearers or co-users No, or they whatever. were not. We have, we have not um, prosecuted anyone who we believe was sharing the drugs with someone, was a family member or a friend. In, in actuality. Ha, have any of your offices had prosecuted anyone that we would categorize as sharing or, or co-users for, for, for under the selling statute? I don't know the answer to that as I sit here. What I will tell you, what my testimony said and what I've had discussions with DA Gonzalez is, certainly this is a practice change. I said my, my words were going forward. We will uh, keep an eye on examples like the ones that I used with the undercover tipping someone for steering them or someone who's sharing, and those are the ones we're gonna look to carve out. Okay. Um, my last question on prosecution and then Council Member Ulrich has a question, then I want to come back and I do want to ask some questions about your diversion programs. Um, have, have there been any incidents, occurrences where where police have uh, like staked out or, or arrested people who've, who've coming out of a, a methadone clinic? Have, have any of those cases been brought to your offices? Are you aware of any of those? I'm not. I will say in the past, and not recently, we've had cases that involved arrests that were made because of the covers um, um, made buys near methadone clinics and so forth. And when we discovered that or learned that information, we disposed of those cases um, because we didn't. Uh, uh, we thought that was not the best way of um, utilizing because obviously many of those cases, um, the individual that comes out believes that person that they're helping is actually going through withdrawal and is seeking to share the drugs with them. Not, not selling as we know selling should be or as the statute, although to give or to exchange, those are the language that's used in the statute, so ultimately um, individuals were arrested. But once we discovered the location, where they were, and, uh, and that that person was actually uh, participating in a methadone clinic and came out of that methadone clinic, we disposed of those cases um, quickly. Okay. Anyone else on that? Same answer. Same answer. Okay. Um, council member. Sorry, I was just, I was gonna, uh, you got to speak up, Councilor. Don't be shy. Uh, if you were in Judge Grasso's no, courtroom and you were wavering, I mean, forget no, uh, it. You know, I, I'm just saying, I would just make this point that there are cases in you know, New York City wide that when there's methadone clinics, I'm not prosecuting, I'm not saying a specific case, but I could understand um, the law enforcement response that there are drug dealers who come to methadone clinics and prey on people who are seeking treatment and realize that that's a vulnerable population. That group of people who are coming there to sell drugs, not the, not the clients who are going to the methadone clinic, but the others, and there are cases like that. That's why it really depends on the facts and it depends on the discretion of, of prosecutors to know the difference. Um, but I think those cases to protect people, I could see that being a, a, a case where someone would make the, the drug say, case. Okay. Council Member Ulrich. All right, thank you, Chair. I appreciate the um, few minutes that I have. I just want to uh, first uh, sort of congratulate Mr. Frazier on his retirement thank coming you. up on it. 
<laughs> you will be sorely missed. You've done a really terrific job. And um, not only Brooklyn, but the city of New York is very lucky to have dedicated people like you uh, serving you know, the public good, so thank you. I think my first question is probably best directed to Mr. Parker or to the special narcotics prosecutor uh, regarding the uh, trafficking in of drugs. I know that we talked uh, somewhat about how some of these opioids are getting into the city, and I think you mentioned, Ms. Brennan, that uh, they're coming in small amounts in the mail. My question is why aren't we having like drug sniffing dogs at the mail processing centers to like sniff these things out, literally. I mean, I'm, I hope I'm not being ignorant. I'm, I'm just no. trying to understand why we're not slowing down the supply that's being mailed into the city of New York. Uh, the, most of the drugs are coming from interna international sources, most from China. The, when I'm talking about the fentanyl analogs now, the ones that I referred to in my testimony, um, and there are basically a few sites around the country where international mail comes in. The one, the local one is at JFK, uh, and that is the screening there is done by Customs Border Patrol, and they have, they have a facility there, they do a lot of screening, but these are little envelopes because it doesn't take very much um, you know, substance. They, um, you know, it's a minute amount that might be within an envelope. So yes, they do have screening there. They do have dogs. Um, I don't know if they have dogs. They have yeah. all kinds of um, Detection. mechanisms. Right. Um, it's not, it's far from perfect. And maybe uh, Chauncey can expand so on that. Was the city or the district attorney's office participating in that in any way, or well, is that we leave that's that? That's all federal. It's all it, federal, and we leave it up to them. Well, yeah, I don't know that we would have the ability to do do that. We we've been in discussions with them. They've come and done presentations to us. We're looking to partner up with them as well as we possibly can. How about when it comes to the local mail processing centers? I mean, how about these random sweeps, maybe like like the the places where the mail gets sorted and then handed out to the carrier. Certainly, if it's still in the envelope, it's still going to be delivered. I mean, like we, we can't just rely know. only on what, what they're doing at JFK. Is there any way for us to partner with the U.S. Postal Service to find out, to, to, to literally, you know, find the, the drugs that's being mailed into the city? I, I think you're, it's a hugely important point that you're making. Um, I would urge you to go to the JFK International Mail Facility because it's, I, I'd never been there and I recently went there. 60% of all international mail comes through there. I think it's a million packages a day. Right. They come from all over the world and they arrive and then they go all over. So a typical thing when they do, and they have dog sniffing dog, they have the drug sniffing dogs, they have equipment, there's more resources from the federal government actually pouring in to these international mail facilities. But as Bridget was saying, something is, you know, it could be a recent seizure was a, one of those birthday cards. When you open it up, it starts to sing. Has five, you know, grams of carfentanil. I mean, so it doesn't take much. It's almost, these are really almost like right. weapons of mass destruction. But they come in. But then you just, when you seize it, now what criminal case do you make? Someone's going to now make that controlled delivery to a barber shop in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And you get, you know, whatever, you, you, there's law enforcement resources for each one of them. They are tracking it and they're putting together and, and both at the state, federal, local level, everybody is working on this because it's the, the threat of the dark web and drugs coming in on the dark web and the synthetics coming in on the dark web is a, is a more than an emerging threat. It's an existing threat. I have a, a more technical question, if I can. One of, we talked about how many people in the city were, died last year because of an opioid um, overdose. Uh, one of them was, a, well, many of them were my constituents, but one in particular was a 30-year-old young man who I know very well. Uh, he was not a drug abuser. He was not somebody that we might call a junkie. Uh, he was a very young, bright, hardworking, educated uh, young man who was uh, at a party and did some drugs that were laced with fentanyl, and his father uh, very tragically found him uh, on the kitchen floor at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, and he had regurgitated as commonly when you find them what was inside of him, but he was, unfortunately, he had passed. Um, you say that you treat some of these as homicides. The father has been, since uh, this young man passed, has been desperately trying to get the police to go in his iPhone. But he says, I want to know where, who, who gave my son those drugs? Where did my son get those drugs? And he said that the detective, because the phone is locked, 
uh, said that they can't go into the phone and, and find that out. Isn't that part of the investigation? Can a judge give them, or the DA request that a judge break into the phone, crack the code, and, and, and find out who he was texting, who he was buying or getting the drugs from? I mean, we have to save other people because obviously he got, right. he got a dirty batch of whatever he consumed, and the father said, my son is gone. I want to save other lives. How come we can't get into my son's phone? You know, what is the reasoning behind that? Uh, yes, they can get into the son's phone. I don't know if he meant that that phone is not, you know, they don't have the capability. Sometimes some of the phones. Well, he's got an iPhone, like everybody, every other 30-year-old. Yeah. So right. my point is, how come you we don't what? have the I... capability, the police or the DA, to get into his phone? I mean, the, the, this we is, could this take is some We could get specific information from you, and maybe together we might be able to see if we can get something more done. Okay, I hope Afterwards, so. Afterwards, we'll, we'll get some specific information. Finally, uh, or I'll, if I'll, he wants to contact. I think he would. Uh, okay. I'll close with this, Chair. You know, there's a lot of, uh, and rightly so, there's a lot of concern and attention paid to uh, preventing people from getting hooked on these drugs and helping people get the treatment that they need. Uh, but there is a lack of support and services for the families that they leave behind. And maybe that's not a very big political issue because it's not a you know, very large constituency, but it is a very needy one. And uh, these families need support, they need counseling, uh, they need help, and uh, you know, they have been deeply affected by this, and they could speak to this crisis better than you or I because they are personally affected by it, obviously. Um, if there's any way to use some of the drug forfeiture money, or the money that you get from these big money laundering cases uh, to pay for support for the families of the victims. Uh, they need it. They're crying out for help, and, um, and they don't always get it from the right places. So if there's any way to, I just put that, I just offer that as a, as a, as a humble suggestion, if there's any way for you to provide help for the grieving families and support, they really need it. Well, if I could just give you one. Okay. okay. If I can just add, those two cases that I spoke about, it was the father of the deceased that came to us and, and, um, and asked for help because he, he was able to get into his son's phone. And then we um, sent in the Obedos um, team who investigated and actually got an undercover to make contact with the number that the individual had been in communication with in, in order to secure his drugs. And I will tell you that father was um, grateful. Um, he came to our office after the prosecution was completed. He met with our DA and met with our team, and he was very thankful for the efforts that um, our office had made uh, in connection with, in conjunction, I would say, with the NYPD in order to bring the individual that he thought had sold his son those um, opioids that led to his death. Certainly, we couldn't bring a homicide case, but we did the best we could. I just, just wanted to add that one of the, the medical examiner's office has just added, to, you, to your point, has just added an investigator who's a um, social worker who is calling um, families, and it was just a gap, and, it, and it's a really important gap that's a little bit filled, but is to talk to the family who wants to um, both figure out what was, it, what was the path of the person who they died, want closure, but also they want information. linking, but from that conversation is linking them to bereavement services, grief services, things like that, that you're absolutely right that there's a huge need there that has been unaddressed, and it's starting to be. And, and we do, uh, part of our overdose response initiative protocol, uh, and every family, either a detective investigator or a victim advocate, reaches out to that family to see if they need help, counseling, guidance, make sure that uh, is if, if it's a death, issues of uh, resolving funerals, if we can somehow help. So it is part of what we do in terms of adding more. We certainly can, but it, it is part of the original plan. Well, Mr. McMahon, I know that Staten Island is a lot like Queens in many ways, and you have certainly been dealing with your a uh, fair share of these cases. I want to thank you and uh, all the district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor for the good work that you do. Uh, we can always do more, we can do better, um, but uh, we have a long way to go to really address this crisis. It's affecting every single community in every neighborhood, every demographic, and we've got to figure out uh, a better way forward because we're leaving too many good people behind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, thank you. and just Part two, but it'll be much shorter than part one, I promise. Diversion. I just want to um, ask a bunch of questions about the diversion programs. The special narcotics prosecutor, you, you had said that there are fewer felony drug defendants going into drug 
court. I yeah. think, think that's what you said. Why is that? Citywide. Why is well, that? First of all, there's just fewer numbers of arrests, if you, okay. and the police strategies have changed as well. So not only are there fewer arrests, there, the police strategy is not targeting that kind of low-level narcotics offender who might be selling drugs to support their own habit. You know, that kind of strategy is not the one that we're seeing used so frequently now, certainly not the one, at least uh, the cases coming into my office. Uh, and so you've got that combination of number one, fewer cases, number two, different police strategies. And then the third factor that you really have to keep in mind is that the um, sentences were changed very substantially. And so these were always viewed as alternative to incarceration program. And one of the big motivating factors is that people were otherwise facing incarceration. Uh, and now they're not facing incarceration. So they're not opting into a treatment program because it's not the same incentive uh, that there was before. So that was an incentive which did push a significant number of people into drug treatment, and it's not there anymore. So you have a confluence of several f factors, I think, that are affecting it. Those numbers are really low. We used to have 500 referrals from my office alone um, you know, some years. So. Uh, I don't think that's going to change, though, and maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. I, I, I think treatment is good. However we get people in treatment, I'm all for it, and we need more of it. Uh, and I, I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Uh, some of it, too, is um, just thinking about cases that may come into us. Uh, you may look at them and say, uh, because you're doing early case evaluation, that this is not a felony, this is a misdemeanor case, uh, so you don't have those cases in the felony treatment parts. Uh, we're dealing with them with in the overdose avoidance and recovery part, and we'll be dealing with them earlier on for HOPE, uh, so that's why you may see it. Also, uh, with it's, it's pre-indictment. Uh, also, um, with the overdose avoidance and recovery program, it, it's something that is voluntary. We want to make sure that people are treatment ready, uh, and you may see uh, us offer other alternatives if someone is not ready for treatment, which may uh, work for like individual counseling or, or something along those lines. So that's why you may see the decreases in those areas. Well, yes. And, and just to underscore that there are so many different options now, and there's a, so a menu of so many different options, whether it's traditional drug treatment court, where you see the decline in numbers, but there's the early diversion, uh, pre-arraignment, post-arraignment, pre-indictment. Uh, there's task doing cases within, our, that's our, our provider in Staten Island Court. So all those cases together, there are many people who are finding alternatives to incarceration, but not in that traditional drug court model for the reasons that everyone else said here. So there's a lot going on, but the traditional drug court model really needs to be revisited because I also want to mention the nature of this addiction. So without that, the stick, then the carrot, a lot of people are, are saying, it, and, uh, well, I don't want to take drug treatment court because I have to plead, and the, the plea is held in, is in abeyance, and I go into a long term, six months, nine months, a year, and if I fail once, I have to, I have to live with that plea. So that model has to be revisited. But there are a lot of other programs that are going on, and a lot of people are being diverted or getting alternatives to incarceration, but not by that traditional model, which I think has to be revisited and reworked, and we're all talking about doing that. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up, because that's where I was going with this. We've been asked by advocates and, and public defenders, is there a rethinking of the drug court model where people have to, I don't know if this is uniform, but people have to plead to the top charge, and then it's an, it's, an, it's an onerous, beneficial, but nonetheless onerous program they have to participate in, and if they, they, they fail, then, then they really have the hammer coming down upon them. Is, is there thinking about being more flexible with just your, your run-of-the-mill drug courts? Uh, as I testified earlier, yes. Um, it's, it's looking at different modalities of treatment when we're talking about harm reduction services, when we're talking about MATs. Um, and so that's why you're, you're seeing that there are a lot of alternatives that are happening outside of the drug treatment court uh, when Judge Grasso was talking about the overdose avoidance and recovery program where we're considering felonies. Um, and this is about meeting people where they are and making sure that we have customizable services to wrap around them and not requiring 
things like please. So yes, uh, we are looking at different models to make sure that we're engaging the people that we're seeing. And we're trying very hard and set on to bring a, the uh, community justice model, the Red Hook Court model, uh, which is a very intensive judicial involvement, a very uh, uh, co-located services in the building. Uh, so that allows for immediate uh, testing and assessment and treatment right in the courthouse, uh, and we're working towards that. And I think that is the model of the future, because this way there's there's a a a, a very uh, frequent uh, visit uh, in the court. The judges are very actively engaged, but then there's that co-located multimodality support that exists, and I think that is the best model for the future. Hey. Also, as I testified, we certainly are looking at that in, in Brooklyn. But I think that in general, I think that we have seen together as a group over the years how things have changed, not only in the type of drugs that are used and, and uh, how uh, people engage within the court system. And I think that we all realize and are looking at doing things differently. That's why even the HOPE, the CLEAR, the Q-TIP, those programs are just, uh, as opposed to forcing somebody into a program, we're getting them to meaningfully engage. And once they, that's the first step. You take those first steps and then I, I can see it uh, evolving even, even more as we uh, proceed down the road. I, I agree with what everyone says, but said, but I think you should also bear in mind that it is important that there be a moving forward of the case. So sometimes if you don't allow someone to plead to something and they don't succeed, then we have to start take this case from its inception all the way through, through um, the court system as well. And it may be that they're in a program for a year um, and then they fail, and now we have to start that process all over again. That affects prosecution, that affects witnesses, and so forth. And I think experiences tells us, and, 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 and I know it might not be, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? The, 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 um, the, the view of many, but. Uh, fashionable? It, yeah, it's fashionable, but it's certainly um, an experience that told us that Having a hammer or, because as many people say, people don't want to necessarily go into treatment, okay? They're not ready, they're in denial, and so it takes something for them to complete the program. And having the, um, the, the possibility that if you don't succeed or if you feel there may be a jail alternative, there may be something, it, it gives them incentive to actually succeed in the program and to not reoffend. I, I don't think anyone here wants to continue to criminalize those who are addicted and are truly in need of help, but I do believe that there has to be a balance, and, and we, we believe that that has worked in the past, having someone plead guilty with the understanding that if you succeed and it gives you incentive to succeed, your case will ultimately be dismissed or, the, or, or reduced to whatever um, other charges, but if you, if you don't follow through, and let me say this, I think someone had said that, you know, if you fail once, you are punished. That is certainly not the case in drug treatment courts. I think we recognize that um, addicts relapse. They're given many opportunities to correct their behavior. They're graduated sanctions that are used before we ever get to um, someone who doesn't succeed in having to actually impose the alternative sentencing. So although I, I agree with everyone that we are looking into creative ways and other ways of possibly um, offering treatment to individuals without them possibly having to plead, um, that we need to keep that in mind as incentive to make sure that they actually... Right, or not necessarily plead to the top count or not necessarily plead with the understanding that if you, if you fail after all the chances that you're given, you know, the sentence that you're going to be able to negotiate for yourself is going to be, going to be worse than if you had just like done a plea deal in the beginning. This is what we hear from. I agree, but I also, but. Uh, What's but that? I, that's kind of an old model. Right. That's the DTAP model. The drug court model, you know, the statutory drug court model is somewhat different, I think. I mean. But the diversion, you're talking about Article 216. Yeah. Diversion is. It's different, but you still have to plead to the top gun unless there are immigration or, or consequences that a judge will allow you not to plead and proceed through treatment. And then if you fail, 
if you fail, then we have to start the process all over again because that person, um, that case is, it has just been in limbo. And obviously, if you succeed, your case is dismissed. But, but that is a caveat that's carved out with Article 216 in the CPL uh, as it relates to immigration consequence, not as to all defense. Um, Judge Grasso had testified, I, I don't think the, the, the Bronx would contradict it, that they're looking to uh, maybe broaden the eligibility for or mm -hmm. so it's not just uh, possession in the seventh degree and, and it's not just uh, drug cases per se, but other cases where there, is that something that Queens might look to with Q-tip? I think we, we, we are looking at that. Currently we started out with the uh, misdemeanor <coughs> drug population, 220-03, but as, I think as we've indicated, we're looking into the petty offense that we believe are typically associated with addiction. There are petty larceny, there are even forgery and check cashing cases that we see people um, do that that are actually addicted. So we intend to expand, but we're, this is a baseline because we believe once we target this population, then certainly we'll expand. And obviously with um, the resources that you're providing will help us to, to um, staff and be able to continue to do that and expand and even expand to our DTAP, uh, our DAT population as well so that we can connect them as early as possible to services right. and those particular crimes as well. And j just last one for, for DA McMahon. The, the, the number of people who are applying, or I don't know if that's even the right term, for HOPE, um, like how many people apply for HOPE? How many people try to seek it and, 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 and how many um, are, are deemed in, ineligible? Is that, is that, I don't even know if that's the right way to phrase it, but. Oh. So uh, I've heard hope concerns that, that there are far more people who are trying to get into hope than, than are able to get in. So uh, yes and no, but let me explain how we got to where we are. It, it went through a 10-month planning process with uh, multiple partners at the table, the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice, Department of Health, the Mayor's Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, Legal Aid, uh, uh, all the providers, the Staten Island Partnership for Community and Wellness, the P our local PPS, um, I don't know who I'm leaving out, but uh, sat around a table for 10 months and worked out the program, and it had to be operational to be successful. And so it was determined that we would do the specific charge, which you've heard a lot of pro programs so far are charge specific, with the hope to expand going further. But by making it charge specific, that mean, meant that a 33,000 member police force could, could make it operational with an operations order. Uh, and to qualify, you have to be DATable, meaning that you qualify for a desk appearance ticket, which in most cases means that you don't have an extensive history um, and that you don't have any warrants and you have identification on you. That is how people qualify for it. Uh, but then there is a conversation as well, uh, because sometimes people may not exactly qualify. There may be an issue, we, and people are on the phone trying to uh, uh, offer it anyway. Uh, sometimes people don't get the offer right away at the uh, precinct, but they'll get it before arraignment if there's some discussion. So we try to do it um, in a way that uh, is more inclusive than exclusive by far. But if you're DATable and you're charge specific, then you are offered hope pretty much uh, automatically. And that's why the number you see is, think about the numbers that we've talked about, over 350 people successful. Uh, who have meaningfully engaged, it's a very high number, so it is inclusive. Uh, and just to the other topic of all the, the different programs, I think whatever programs we seek to in, in, uh, um, uh, employ uh, and uh, use going further, the more resources we have, the more court involvement we have, and back to the topic of this hearing, drug treatment court only works if the judge has the time and the resources available to him and her to have discussions with the defendant, to have graduation programs, to have the resources in the court to make those connections, whatever the requirements are, whatever the charges are, it can only work that way. And what we've seen in Staten Island is we've gotten away from that. It's now mixed in a regular court calendar, and I think that's one of the reasons, amongst all the others, that it's not as effective as it should be. Though, for the record, we gave you the hope money you asked for. And for the record, I thanked you in my testimony effusively. As, as a former council member, can we be thanked enough? <laughs> no. Thank you all very much. You all have very important responsibilities. I appreciate your spending so much time with us. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from our public defenders.
Um, and if the Drug Policy Alliance could testify alongside the public defenders, we'd appreciate it. All right, let's, uh, let's get sworn in and we'll get started, all right? You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. So just identify yourself for the record and testify away. Good afternoon, my name is Melissa Moore. I'm the Deputy State Director for New York at the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, thank you, Chair and Council Members for being here. Um, the Drug Policy Alliance appreciates the opportunity to testify this afternoon. As the overdose uh, crisis continues, it's imperative to examine the role of the criminal. Sorry, let me just interrupt for a moment. Do you have written testimony? I'm part. Do you have written testimony? I didn't bring copies today, but I'll follow okay. up. Okay, I just wanted to make sure if you did, I wanted right. Okay, thanks. Apologies. Um, historically, the criminal justice system has delivered punishment to individuals for crimes related to substance use. The opioid overdose crisis has led to some procedural and rhetorical shifts, as we've heard just now in this last panel, that have increased access to treatment and diversion programs. However, the criminal justice system has yet to embrace a total public health approach toward addressing people who use drugs. This is most evident when prosecutors are determining who should be diverted into a treatment program and who receives the protection of legal interventions such as the 911 Good Samaritan Law. There is not evidence to support the assertion that we just heard that coercing people into treatment is in any way effective. That's a dangerous, flawed model. Um, the criminal justice system is often employed when public health response would be more appropriate and disparities in enforcement, prosecution, and outcomes are rampant with regard to this in New York. Despite the lower arrests pointed out by the special narcotics prosecutor, there are quite extreme disparities. Research from the Misdemeanor Justice Project at John Jay outlines trends for misdemeanor arrests in non-marijuana drug offenses in New York City. And in 2016, the arrest rate for drugs other than marijuana was 2.2 times higher for black people than the arrest rate, rate for whites and 1.5 times higher for Latinos. Disparities extend to outcomes in terms of conviction and sentencing as well. For example, in Kings County Court, 63% of white people are convicted versus 72% for black people and 74% for Latino people versus 23% who receive an ACD, that's for white people and only 14% and 13% for black and Latino folks, respectively. We urge this committee and the district attorneys of each borough to closely examine their data and change their policies to avoid these disparities. Criminal courts are attempting to divert more people into treatment. However, initiatives such as Staten Island's HOPE program still leave people behind. As you noted, it ex potentially excludes people who have previous felony convictions. And despite what DA McMahon said, uh, he failed to mention that for every one person who has been accepted into the program, two were denied. 
Courts looking to adopt the HOPE model need to ensure that the door is open to everyone who is in need of care for substance use and not withhold treatment because of a person's criminal history. While people can be denied treatment due to their criminal history, judges are also given extreme discretion to determine whether or not a person is eligible for diversion, and these choices can be influenced by their own personal bias. As we've seen in so many other aspects of the criminal justice system, like your work on around marijuana enforcement has pointed out, where there's discretion, there can often be stark disparities. A former public defender working in a New York County court reported that a judge denied a defendant admittance to a diversion program because she believed the defendant to be dishonest because the defendant was abstinence for a period of time and could not account for when he had relapsed. The defender working on behalf of the client stated that the judge often rations treatment, only affording it to those she considers to be the most deserving. It's important to note that the decision to route people into the criminal justice system and incarceration instead of treatment can have deadly consequences. People exiting incarceration are at extremely high risk of overdose compared to the general population. Research shows that in the immediate two weeks after release, formerly incarcerated people are almost 130 times more likely to die of an overdose than the general population. Clearly, incarcerating people who use drugs is not an effective public health response. And one of the most concerning elements of the criminal court's response to addressing the overdose crisis is the prosecution of people who exchange or sell drugs with homicide or manslaughter charges. While the federal court has been the common path for these drug-induced homicide prosecutions, um, the Staten Island DA's office has attempted to bring manslaughter or homicide charges against sellers in more than 240 overdose cases. I just have to stop you there. What, what does it mean they attempted to? My, my understanding is that they investigated as such and put a lot of pressure on people who, uh, who were around that person who had died to, um, to either testify or to come forward in the case. Um, I can find out more specifics. Um, additionally, uh, drug-induced homicide, homicide measures can potentially exacerbate the overdose crisis. They undermine Good Samaritan laws which were implemented precisely to encourage people to contact emergency services to respond to an overdose. The most common reason that witnesses cite for not seeking medical attention for an overdose is fear of police involvement, and those who do call the police are likely to delay the call by five or more minutes. When we know that in this moment, with fentanyl being in the supply, the window for an overdose can be 60 seconds, those five minutes people just don't have. The increased criminalization of people who use and sell drugs only exacerbates the very problem that prosecutors are supposedly trying to address. It increases stigma, drives people away from needed care, and will likely result in the same racial disparities that are now synonymous with other drug war tactics. It's also key to note that half of the over $140 million budgeted through the New York City Healing NYC plan is allocated to the NYPD. And although some of that funding does go toward naloxone training and distribution, a significant portion goes toward death scene investigations in an effort to arrest sellers. This is a significant waste in resources and will do little to avoid these overdose deaths. And I also want to remind the committee that the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor was created during the heroin crisis in the 1970s, but it hasn't worked. Substantial evidence shows that supply-side interventions and increased criminal penalties do not have any effect on reducing either the supply of drugs or the demand for them. All efforts should be made to divert people who use drugs from criminal court and place them into community-based treatment or harm reduction settings where they can receive necessary care. If actors from the criminal justice system wish to intervene in response to the opioid crisis, all adopted practices must be non-punitive. And again, we would note that DAs and NYPD are not social workers or providers of social support. We need resources to go to the organizations and entities that are outside of the criminal justice system to provide those services. We would also recommend that people diverted into mandated treatment should have access to all forms of evidence-based treatment and harm reduction resources, that law enforcement officials should divert people into community-based treatment spaces in lieu of criminal court, that judges Judicial discretion should be checked so that individual biases do not influence treatment decisions and should make more offenses eligible for diversion. Um, we should not exclude people because of their criminal histories if they need care and support. Thank you very much. My name is Young Mi Lee. I'm a supervising attorney uh, in the criminal defense practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Uh, I want to first of all thank the council and Chair Lanceman for inviting us to testify today. 
First, uh, I want to applaud BDS uh, Mayor de Blasio for embracing the safer consumption space model sought by people who use drugs and harm reduction specialists. The four overdose prevention centers, if approved by the New York State Health Department, will build on the successes of other sites around the world and save lives. We hope the program becomes an example for the rest of the country as public health initiatives originating in the city often are. Crucially, these centers must not become dragnets for the NYPD, which could seriously undermine their efficacy, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, BDS believes a public health approach is essential to reducing the harms of addiction and recreational drug use alike. The criminal legal system is simply ill-equipped to prevent drug use, meaningfully reduce the supply of drugs, or most important, to help people help keep people who use drugs as safe as possible and to minimize the harm to their families and communities. Yet still our city and state pursue and fund this approach lavishly. The fourth and fifth top arrests in New York City are low-level marijuana possession and low-level possession of other drugs. The city's and state's discordant efforts to meld the enforcement and public health approaches often result in unnecessary and counterproductive incarceration and criminal records, social stigma, and tragic deaths. In Brooklyn, there are four specialized treatment courts, uh, and my written testimony explains in much greater detail uh, what each of them um, are about. Um, however, I, I do want to point out that as a result of these treatment courts, uh, the, the, number of the number of people who are incarcerated on drug or nonviolent cases has obviously significantly gone down. Um, but that said, these treatment courts do not address really, um, are not, they're the band-aid um, in terms of the public health crisis that we face right now. We have cases, uh, we have technically violent felonies where people really need treatment and they're ineligible for drug treatment. Um, we have, uh, underfunding of treatment programs where people are simply kicked out on very simple technical violations and then they face uh, a lengthy prison sentence. So there are disincentives uh, to participating in these treatment programs, especially those charged with the felonies. Um, and I've been doing this for 20 years and I can tell you that when uh, treatment is mandated when it's coerced by a court, by the police, by prosecutors. Uh, the success rate is just not as high as it should be. Um, we often get people who are charged in these dragnet um, or predatory buy and bust operations, which still happen, by the way. And those are situations where undercover police officers pretend to be drug addicts uh, and they prey on other drug addicts. And it's clear who they are. Um, they're often mentally ill, um, and they're often, I hate to say it, they look like drug addicts. They're strung out, they're looking for uh, a hit on the street, and they approach these individuals um, and arrest them uh, after making um, a so-called drug exchange or a drug sale, when in fact what they're doing is they're just going up to someone knowing that a fellow drug addict will be sympathetic and help them purchase drugs both for himself or herself, as well as the undercover officer. This is still going on. This is a waste of police resources. These are people who do end up in the treatment courts. Um, the, the police are not really using these arrests to enhance the arrest, to go and uh, arrest uh, major, the major narcotics dealers. Um, and, and the treatment programs are lengthy, and sometimes they're very onerous. Even if law enforcement interventions were an effective tool to reduce the supply of drugs, um, these NYPD tactics are simply not the way to get the, drug, the true drug dealers off the street. Um, at, earlier, there was a question about whether arrests are still, made outside, are still being made outside methadone clinics. They are, in fact, um, still occurring outside methadone clinics. We have clients who are arrested on felony charges of sale of methadone where clients will go and get their uh, supply of methadone to sustain them, and they are approached by undercover officers outside these methadone clinics, um, where they basically beg uh, our clients to give them a portion of their supply because they, they look desperate. 
And any fellow drug addict, unfortunately, knows that feeling, and they will um, share their methadone. So that is still happening. Um, this, this police tactic is not saving lives. Um, many times, um, these people do not, are not incentivized to enter into a drug treatment program. There is a sense of outrage. Um, and as I said earlier, if treatment is forced upon people um, and there is coercive police tactics that are being used, um, there's really no incentive to do drug treatment. I am um, a big proponent of drug treatment courts in Brooklyn. I have a lot of clients over the years who have gone through the treatment uh, process and successfully completed the process, but I am not seeing, as a result of this, the reduction in um, drug dealings that are happening. I am seeing clients who fail um, and who do end up with criminal records, who do end up going to prison or jail. Uh, and, and overall, there are a wide swath of people out there who are, even when they do try uh, to get a dismissal upon completion of the treatment, even though they do try the treatment and they still fail, um, it's not the way to address this public health crisis. Um, we have had clients who uh, were doing treatment voluntarily. They get arrested by the police. Um, we had a 40-year-old client recently who um, was a homeless man. He was getting treatment services. He was arrested. He was incarcerated. And uh, unfortunately, that set his whole treatment process backwards. Um, and now there's a question as to whether he will do treatment through the treatment court. It's a, it's a very precarious position for our clients uh, once they are arrested. Most of our clients do um, understand what the treatment process is like, but they also understand that the treatment programs out there are not necessarily sufficient, especially if our clients do have um, the dual diagnosis with a mental illness um, as well. Those programs in particular, when the DA's office or the treatment court insists on residential treatment, those programs uh, will oftentimes have a long waiting period for a bed. Um, and that, again, is uh, a reason for our clients to not choose that treatment alternative. So rather than uh, spending, I understand that the New York, uh, that the mayor's Health NYC initiative uh, half the budget is going towards the investigation of these opioid deaths towards NYPD. Um, that seems like an extremely large amount of money to spend uh, on investigating these deaths as opposed to expanding treatment services. Um, and I will tell you that with the treatment programs that the drug treatment courts use, those are treatment programs that people also voluntarily enter without a court mandate. So there's, there's a large amount of people who, are, who want to do the drug treatment program voluntarily, and then there are those people who are being mandated through the drug treatment court, hence oftentimes the wait um, to, get those residential be uh, to get those residential beds. Um, I think what we need is perhaps an expansion of these types of programs an effort to make them more voluntary. And what's also very important, unfortunately, is to ensure that there's proper oversight of these programs, because I see a wide variety in the quality of treatment um, that our clients receive when they do um, enter these programs. Um, so I do um, want to emphasize again that BDS really uh, is a big proponent of the health, um, the public health approach to this opioid crisis. Um, thank you both. So I, I just want to understand, the, you don't think that there's, um, there's any value to, to the carrot and stick, the stick part of the carrot and stick approach? I mean, don't you have, because I've, I've heard from, from, from public defenders and, and advocates, certainly that, that stick could be too, too much and that there are certain circumstances, or like a lot of circumstances, where the 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 stick of the the the, the stick is, is so much for, towards if you're going to go into a program that that you'd rather you'd rather get the shorter stick and and just you know plead guilty and just take your lumps and and and, and move on. But 
you know, the stick, um, the stick can be too much, and I'm not advocating for a change in the, cha um, the Drug Law Reform Act. Um, but for people who are first-time offenders, uh, for me, when I when I talk to my clients who are first-time felony, you know, this sometimes the carrot is if you successfully finish the program, you will get a dismissal. It will be off your record. It's not necessarily the jail alternative. Alternative. I mean, obviously, people don't want to go to jail, um, but at least with the Brooklyn DA's office, they are willing to work on a reasonable jail alternative if it is the first felony offense. So oftentimes, even if the upfront plea is to maybe uh, the D, nonviolent drug felony, the jail alternative might be six months. Um, so, but then there are plenty of clients who, who, who need people, I should say, who, who need to be ready, who want to do it voluntarily, they know that even with the graduated sanctions for relapses, they also know that sometimes the drug treatment programs will kick them out uh, for really minor infractions, uh, and then there'll be uh, a period of incarceration while the drug treatment court staff will have to find a new treatment program, a different program to place them in. Um, so there is a perception out there that the, the jail sanctions that could follow for minor infractions um, can be heavy, and that's a disincentive for people to, at the outset, want to do the program. And I would just add on to that, that the criminal justice system and the, and the jail system in general just is not an appropriate mechanism for providing treatment to people. Um, the fact that Rikers is actually one of the largest providers of medication-assisted treatment and other actually very effective and evidence-based treatments for people who struggle with substance use is you know, a, a testament to the doctors working at Rikers, but is wholly inappropriate that people have to be in that setting in order to receive treatment. The same, um, same could be said, unfortunately, for mental health. Exactly. I don't know that they do as good a job as in providing those mental health services, but... Rikers is basically the largest mental health institution in, in the five boroughs. Exactly, and I, you know, I would posit that it's inappropriate for funds and resources to be directed into that system and for people to have to channel into that system in order to receive those services when we're recognizing that people are struggling with a range of different things and we need to, to intercept that. Um, but it, you know, would also just say that I think substantial evidence from across the 40-year war on drugs shows the failure of criminalizing and, and the stick part of the carrot and stick to, to move people in this direction at all. And research from Pew also shows that states that increase their incarceration rates don't experience any decrease in drug use whatsoever. So in terms you, of looking. Right. Do, I get it. Do you think it's a mistake for the police and the DAs to treat every um, opioid overdose as, as a homicide investigation? I think it has a chilling effect. You know, what we've heard anecdotally from people is How so? the more the, the narrative is out there that they're going after anybody who possibly has a connection to somebody uh, deters people wanting to call 911 under the Good Samaritan law. But, but it deters people yeah. from even wanting to go to the hospital after they've been revived from an overdose by naloxone. We've heard many, many stories from harm reduction agencies talking about reversing an overdose with naloxone and the person seeing just EMS workers in uniform walking up thinking that they're NYPD mm -hmm. and having just been on the brink of death trying to get up and run away because they're so concerned that it's an officer and not being willing to go to the hospital and actually re receive care and treatment because they're so concerned about the criminalization. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think um, even those who, who do survive the drug overdose, um, I'm reminded that the Good Samaritan law only protects you from dealing in possession charges and not homicide charges. It, it, it definitely does, um, but we, um, my office actually, we recently had a case where there was an arrest. We did eventually get the dismissal based on that law, but there was an arrest. Uh, and the NYPD will still arrest and say, well, that can be resolved by the prosecutors. So it's not necessarily a win-win situation where the police will show up and the 911 caller will say, well, actually, you can't arrest me. Um, I also think to, to a certain extent, just for practical purposes, it's counterproductive uh, 
Uh, I have had plenty of clients where um, law enforcement, the DAs have asked for cooperation, um, and it's not, it's not something that's necessary, it's not something that people wanna do. Um, so it's counterproductive. And, and people also get into questions about invasion of privacy, if they have to turn over their phones. It's just, um, it gets very, we're talking about police interrogations, about searches. Um, it's not something that we <laughs> would support, and our clients would not want that. I would also highlight some of the unintended consequences. Um, you know, this is, often sort of the chain of events that we see when there's a crackdown response and a criminalization response to a public health issue. Um, now, because of some of these patterns of investigations and the fact that every overdose is treated this way by the DA's offices and by the NYPD, we're seeing that people who sell are less likely to stamp their, their product with a uniquely identifying stamp, which actually before was really helpful for people who use drugs to be able to, to identify if there was a bad batch, that they could avoid it. And so now that there's a, a reduced likelihood that stamps will be there, it's a lot harder for people to avoid what's bad and what they know is contaminated. Um, so it's actually a contributing factor to some of the overdose deaths, I would posit. That's interesting. I mean, I, I do think, you know, the NYPD will have to investigate these op opioid deaths as homicides. I, I think the large amount of funding that's going towards that um, is just maybe misguided, and the allocation of resources is being misused, um, and that maybe not so much money should go towards NYPD, but maybe more towards dealing with really the public health crisis at issue in terms of the, uh, the intervention centers, um, the programs, diverting people away from the criminal justice system. All right. Well, thank you very, both very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. That concludes our hearing.